everyone joining us on this hopefully beautiful day. It is my honor to welcome all of you to the Social Media for Therapists workshop. I hope you're all as excited as I am to be here today and learn from the absolutely incredible Matthias Barker. Before we begin today, I would like to go over a couple quick things because I know there will be some questions. There always are. Make sure we get out ahead of those so that hopefully we can make your experience as best as possible. If you have any general questions regarding CE or the event, please visit the FAQ page in your event portal that you use to access this webinar. A lot of the questions, thankfully, can be answered there. If you have any content-related questions that you would like Matthias to answer, there will be a Q&A feature available in the Zoom toolbar that should be opened up in about 30 to an hour from now. If you see any questions in there you like or you would like specifically asked, please click the thumbs up under the question. That way we can prioritize the question that more of you people actually want to see and get answered. Matthias will personally be reading and answering your Q&A throughout the day, which is very cool, might I add. Breaks currently are scheduled to be mid-morning at around 11 central time. Lunch is scheduled to be at 12.50 central time to 2 p.m. central time. Make sure you have that one written down. And then mid-afternoon break will be 3.15 p.m. central time, somewhere around there for 15 minutes. A couple of reminders around CE. If you have purchased live CE credit, your, C your live CE certificate will be made available to you after the event has officially ended. If you have not purchased CE credit, there is still time to do so. All registrants will have 14 days access to this recording. So if you feel like you missed anything or you wanna rewatch something, don't worry. Regardless if you paid or not, you will have access to that recording. From there, uh, it is my great honor to welcome the one and only Matthias Barker. Hi, everyone. Happy to be here with you. Oh, this is going to be a good day. Um, I'm excited just to talk about what it looks like to bring um, a message of health, a message of healing, a message, I don't know, of psychoeducation to the broader public uh, through social media, how to do so ethically, what it might look like to build a personal brand, to build a brand for your group practice, to kind of... I don't know, maybe even just uh, something that's more message driven. If you have a mission, if there's something that's just really important that's on your heart that you think the world would be benefited in, how do we get that message out to people using social media? That's really the message today. That's what we're talking about. All right, let me share a screen. I'm gonna have some slides today. They're gonna correspond to your manual. All right. Let's play there. Social media for therapists, how to practically and ethically become an influential clinician online. Here's kind of an outline for the day. You can think of today as kind of like a sandwich. Um, we're going to start with some kind of like just basic tips and tools um, for actual strategic growth. We're going to talk about what it looks like to uh, practically and technically actually kind of grow a following on various social media platforms. And then the bulk, kind of like the the middle of the sandwich is going to be about ethics and how to do so ethically. How do we do this in a way that's going to be very positive uh, for both our clients that we have in our practice and also for the general public. And then we're going to end with some viral content strategies, how to actually make videos um, or written text online that actually grabs people's attention and can have broad reach. So all those strategies, I'm really giving you everything today. You know, like I, I'm really not holding back anything. So here's kind of where I want to start. The conversation about ethics and social media, it's it, it used to be really centered around adding people as Facebook friends and looking up clients online to learn about them. And so like, at least that's what it was for me. When I was taking ethics uh, seminars and I don't know, my internship as, as an associate, um, that seemed to be the conversation. Is, is it ethical to look them up? I don't know, that's, that's not really what we're concerned about now. The conversation's really changed. Like you might've seen news articles um, in different publications talking about how there's some problematic stuff happening on TikTok, right? So your therapist is on TikTok. Will your therapy session end up there too? Here's an article talking about as a social media plays an ever more central role in society. Therapists have taken to online spaces to discuss mental health issues. Many of them share video vignettes and react to conversations with clients, reenact. Now, um, this was interesting. The American Psychological Association produced a set of non-binding social media guidelines in 2021, but it did not address the issue of sharing anonymous 
or generalized client conversations on TikTok. And this is actually a quote from the senior director of health at the APA. Uh, when the writers were building the social media guidelines, I don't think it occurred to them that a therapist might go on TikTok. There's no overarching policy system out there to ensure that therapists are not violating patient privilege and confidentiality. This is not just you know a standout article. There's tons of them. Help my therapist is an influencer. Okay, so during the pandemic, when the world's mental health took a nosedive, the amount of mental health content on social media, on TikTok in particular, shot up. Um, the mental health tag has 70.5 billion views. There's an explosion of popularity. I, I think we've all been able to kind of see this happening in the background, whether or not you're on TikTok, whether or not maybe you're really active on social media or not. There has been this huge influence, this huge influx of therapists posting online. Um, it's not always gone well. In August of 2022, one licensed counselor uh, was the receiving end of backlash after she posted a TikTok in which she complained about a client trauma dumping, uh, where a person overshares traumatic details without the other person's consent. After a wave of negative comments, harassing phone calls, one star reviews on her private practice, she deleted her account. I'm sure she heard from her supervisor after that. Um, another one, the Huff Post. Increasingly, it feels like it's becoming normalized for therapists to speak about their clients in their social media, which has made people wonder how ethical it is. And here's a quote from someone on Twitter. Therapists are not supposed to be using their clients to become influencers. Sharing helpful info without generalizing or diagnosing is great, but making your clients wonder if they're going to talk about them affects the relationship. This has caused many to ask, is having a professional account on social media inherently unethical? Right? Should all therapists stay off social media? Should we be posting on TikTok and <laughs> result in having your license revoked? I've had several conversations where that's been the conviction. Here's my answer. No, I don't think so. And here's here's why. Like, do we really think that all of our heroes who are on social media are all acting unethically? I mean, I don't think so. I believe there's a way that we can navigate and build a professional page on social media in a way that does right by our clients. Now, that's not um, the end of the problem, though, because a lot of people are also asking, why go through the hassle of building, I don't know, some big online presence or brand um, posting all the time? Why spend the hours and time to do something like that? And here's what I've noticed. I think that therapists have kind of a love-hate relationship with social media, but expanding your reach on social media can help. It can attract ideal clients, it can enrich your practice. It can carve out a niche and gain global recognition. It can open the doors to book deals and speaking events. It can uh, teaching opportunities, interviews. It's really a way to get your message, your expertise out there. And there's all sorts of doors that that can open for you. Even, you know, for those of you who are leading a group practice, for those of you who are trainers who want to teach, I don't know, your supervision or that you want to attract, you know, associates or people who are learning under a certain method, you can attract your ideal therapists or students. You can kind of be the gold standard. You have a reputation amongst your colleagues by growing on social media. You can open the doors for collaborations, being able to have uh, like-minded colleagues um, have public conversations, right? And here's, here's the reality. It's like we're entering a new world where mental health content is going out on social media. And what we've traditionally thought of as a therapist is having more and more flexibility, the actual business model of what it can look like to, I don't know, be engaging with the public in their mental health. Has had more flexibility than ever. So that's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about how to do this ethically. And you might be wondering, okay, well, why should I listen to you, this guy? Um, here's, here's the reality is that I've done this. This has been my whole thing. I'm I'm really about two things. The past six years, I've single-mindedly focused on two things. One is how to heal from trauma. <laughs> that's That's been an obsession. Two is how to get that message out on social media. Um, I have 3 million followers across multiple platforms. Uh, and I've built an online business selling workshops and courses on mental health. And the reality is that lots of people have um, made a course and tried to sell a course online. I've done it successfully. I've I have over 200,000 participants in these events, over a million dollars in sales in these workshops and these events. 
I've done it successfully. I know the ins and outs of what this really means. And the reality is I, I know many of the major folks who have done this successfully too. Like all the people kind of in kind of the larger public sphere, we all have a group text thread <laughs> and, and we talk. I mean, it's like you kind of have these collaborations and you meet with people and you're you know, talking to one another. Like, how are you doing this? What have you done? What's working? What's not working? So, hey, they've told me their secrets. So I really, my intention today is to tell you anything that you want to know. I'm not gatekeeping any of the information. I don't have some big like pitch to like, oh, the real secrets are here if you only pay, you know, 1995. It's, I'm going to tell you anything in the Q&A. You can ask, ask me anything. Today, I'm going to tell you through my method of how I make content in the, across different platforms. If you have really specific questions, if you have broader questions, I'm here for you. I want to help because I think these messages really matter. I think you have a particular voice, a particular point of view that others would be benefited from. And if it's your personal ambition that you want to bring that message outside of just the doors of your counseling office into the general public, then I want to help. Um, and here's, here's something too, really the only offer that I have for you is that I do group consultations. So like I said, I'm going to tell you everything you want to know today. If you want direct feedback from me, though, if you want feedback kind of from a broader group of people, you can join the group consultations. It's, it's really like a therapy consultation group. So if you're doing like EMDR, if you're doing IFS, um, if you're doing something like that, it's like where you all get on a Zoom call, someone brings a case, they talk about and then, you know, what they're struggling with. And then the supervisor kind of gives advice or breaks down an approach. It's kind of the same thing. So someone will bring like a video, like a one minute video or a written piece, something that they're working on. The whole group can give feedback on it. I can give feedback about make it better. And then we have a Facebook group. Everyone can get together and you can post your stuff, get feedback from other people, collaborate, network with other people who are doing stuff. So really cool. If you want to learn about that, flashabarker.com slash groups. So that's really the only thing I got for you today. But like I said, everything that I know, I'm down to share with you right here, right now in this event. Um, I'm not here to teach you how to be a cringy influencer. I, I, when I talk to therapists, this is the biggest pushback I get is like, gross. It sounds awful. Like I'm, I'm not some narcissistic, self-obsessed person who wants everyone to look at me. I don't want to be a celebrity. I don't want to be out there like sacrificing my privacy, telling everyone, oh, you should listen to me because I have everything all figured out. And I think what people are responding to is influencer culture. We're not in influencer culture anymore. There's been a shift that I need to tell you about. And I want to tell you about this because I don't think anyone's talked about this. And it's, it's something I've noticed. It's something that many of my you know, colleagues and people who do social media full time that, that we've noticed is that there was a shift in COVID. There was a shift during the pandemic that went from influencer to content creator. And that might seem like a synonymous term. It's not. There's some radically different pieces to what's happened since the pandemic. You need to know about it. One of my favorite authors, his name is Neil Postman. He's a culture critic. He was writing in the 60s about the television. He's a media ecologist. Here's a quote from him. Um, in the year 1500, 50 years after the printing press was invented. We did not have old Europe plus the printing press. We had a different Europe. After the television, the United States was not America plus television. Television gave a new um, correlation to every political campaign, every home, every school, every church, every industry. Therefore, when an old technology is assaulted by a new one, institutions are threatened. When institutions are threatened, a culture finds itself in crisis. This is serious business. Something changed in 2020. The landscape is different. There was an explosion of therapy content in the pandemic for two reasons. One, people were isolated and they were worried, right? During the lockdowns, there was a demand. But two, there was a mass adoption of TikTok. TikTok did something different, right? 2020, this is a report. TikTok use had a 40% rise in just one year, which analysts said was the result of COVID-19 pandemic and it's ensuring lockdowns. TikTok introduced a radical technological change to the landscape, democratized video viewership. Here's what this means. That might sound like, what are you talking about? Here's, the, here's why this is important. Never before in the internet world could you go from having no followers to 500,000 views on a video. That just wasn't even feasible. TikTok Instead of prioritizing things like a really uh, beautiful feed, like on Instagram, instead of prioritizing being connected with your friends, like on Facebook, um, it prioritized the value of the individual piece of content. That means if that one video that you posted was great, it was going to push that out to everybody. 
there's there's people on TikTok where they've only posted one video ever on their whole account and it got 10 million views. And that's not just one or two people. Like hundreds of people have had that experience. And that's because the algorithm was different. The algorithm, instead of trying to get a lot of followers, instead of kind of promoting these individual people, it's kind of these models of emulation, it democratized video viewership, which means one video or one tile, if that piece of content resonated with people, it was going to go viral within a couple of days. And that was a significant enough technological shift to change everything. Here's Here's what happened in the past, 2014, 2019, we're in the influencer days, right? So it's hard to break in. It's a clicky, it's exclusive, and everyone had to be perfect and polished, right? Think about like the perfect influencers with the kind of perfect pose and their travel with their perfect kids and makeup's totally done. Like that was the standard, especially on Instagram, was this influencer culture. And I know that because I was there. I did this adventure photography thing. Like if you scroll back on my Instagram far enough, you're gonna see all these nature photos. Because back in like 2013, 2014, that was the thing. You did these really epic, cinematic, like polished, like perfectly edited photos in any industry, whether it was nature and hiking, whether it was makeup and brands, whether it was sports, whether it was fitness coaching, everything was polished. And the, the reality was that it was really difficult to break in. You had to be part of something called the, um, you know, had to, you had to get a part of something called the, the suggested list, which meant that Instagram picked you out as a model of emulation and then pushed you out to people. And then you got a lot of followers. That's how you grew, you know, or, you know, on different platforms like YouTube. It was just super challenging to build up an audience. And people were very exclusive. They, did, they were not collaborative. They didn't share with people. So it created kind of a toxic culture. Now, here's what happened post-pandemic with the democratization of TikTok. It was easiest. It's the easiest it's ever been to reach your audience. Like, it's not about breaking in. It's about the quality of the content. And it's really collaborative. We'll talk a little bit later about what duets and stitches are, if you haven't heard that term before. But kind of the nature of TikTok is collaborating and commenting on other people's work. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. But just take my word for it for now. The, the landscape is super collaborative. It's super like, hey, if you win, then I win. Let's let's win together. And then it's phone camera driven. This is actually important. People valued authenticity over being polished. And that has a lot to do with Gen Z and the values of Gen Z over millennials. Um, essentially, you could break it down like this. In the past, it was about being a model of emulation. It was about being this having this picture perfect life and the economic plan was to live off brand deals, right? Now it's a totally different landscape. You're a teacher. Specifically, you're, you teach information or you teach skills, you teach art, something like that. And then authenticity is actually prioritized over perfection. And you live off selling your creative or information product. You know, you don't, you don't live off brand deals. And that has a long explanation too. I won't go into it tons, but the idea was in the past, you the way the algorithm worked was that if you had a ton of followers you could count that every post that you put up on in front of your audience was seen by a lot of your audience and so people used to be obsessed with your like ratios meaning that let's say you had 500,000 followers and you got 30,000 likes you know on a post you could you could reasonably assume on every post you put up there you're going to have around the same amount of likes now totally different i have you know 2.7 million tiktok followers and I have videos that go into the millions. I have videos that are 300,000-ish. That's kind of my average. And then I have videos that get like 4,000 views. What's with that? And here's the reality is like, I know people with 10 million followers that will have videos that 200,000, 300,000, 10 million, or 400. Because it's not about how many followers you have anymore. It's not about your like ratio. That's not really a thing anymore. The reality is it's only on the value of that individual piece of content, which killed brand deals. Like, I don't know if you noticed that. It was like, if you made a living off of being able to put an ad in front of your audience, your, your job got way harder because it's not obvious that you could do like a Nissan deal or a deal with, I don't know, L'Oreal and then get in front of your audience. If that individual picture or video was not killer, no one was going to see it. You know, and that actually kind of killed in large part, not completely. There's still tons of people who do brand deals, obviously, but it changed the way we approach it, certainly. So people have shifted over to the economic model being about selling a creative or information product. 
um, of some sort, whether it's their art, whether it's like a makeup line, whether it's, you know, video presets, you know, something along those lines. Okay. So here's what happened in 2020. There was like a whole group that went crazy on TikTok. There was like, I mean, these are like the top five, I think, as, as I kind of noticed it. And we all know each other. We've all been on talks and lives. And it's like, it all kind of happened all at once around 2020, 2021. A bunch of us just shot up into like 2 million, you know, 3 million, 1 million. And it was kind of surreal. Uh, Julie was the first one. So Dr. Julie on the, on the far left, she was the first one to kind of trailblaze. And then many of us followed behind. And there's certainly more than just this. This isn't an exhaustive list, but it was a pretty big revolution. It was like, there really wasn't a therapist content creator before. There was like Dr. Phil, you know, there was like, there were, there were some people on Instagram. Instagram had more of them. But I, I remember when I first got on TikTok, I was trying to explain to people, Julie has the same story, but I was trying to explain to people what I was doing. And I'm like, hey, I have like half a million followers on TikTok. It's super weird. And the TikTok, isn't that the app where like teenage girls dance? And I'm like, yeah. And it was like, and then people were like, so are you, are you dancing? And I'm like, no, no, I'm not like mental health. I'm not, I'm not doing that. I'm just talking in front of a camera. And uh, they're like, it's working. And I'm like, yeah. I don't know. Julie was same thing. She said, I didn't want to tell any of my colleagues about it at first. Like, I think I had a million followers before I told any of my friends because we were kind of embarrassed. Like it was weird. Like we're on the teenager app and we're like, are we allowed to be here? Like the millennials kind of like getting into the teenager app and it was awkward. It was almost embarrassing to bring up. Um, so it was a little strange. So that was kind of what happened on TikTok. Now, Instagram had a lot more activity on it. There's a lot of people. This is not an exhaustive list of who's big on Instagram. There's tons of people who are big on Instagram, but I think there's some major figures. I think uh, Nicola Perra, the holistic psychologist, she really was a trailblazer. I think she brought especially trauma content into the general public, unlike really anybody. Like she's she's one of the greats. And I think that she's polarizing. Some people really agree with her work. Some people are really opposed to it. I I've, I've gotten to meet with her. I've talked with her. We've uh, collaborated together. I think she's really aligned. I think she's doing really, really good work. And the reality is like, she is probably the most generous person when it comes to like helping people grow on social media that I've met. She was like, we went to dinner. She's sharing any question that I had, any secret that I wanted to know, any like way to grow or, you know, concept or books or like Facebook ads. And it was like, and she's done that for a lot of people. I think most of the people that are in the public eye right now, have um if they have a subscription program in the therapist space they've consulted with nicole and nicole's done it for free so i don't know i just want to say that like i think sometimes she gets a you know a bit of criticism as anyone does in the public eye but i think she's really doing great work uh dr becky i mean same kind of deal she blew up right, right around the pandemic too rising woman she was like a kind of a staple account she's not a therapist i don't think she might be i don't want to i think she's a coach but she's done tons of training and like somatic you know stuff parts work like she's She's done her homework. She's really um, has a lot of substance there, but she's she's running a great account there. Huberman Lab, good grief, that guy took off during the pandemic as well. He's not a therapist. He's a he's a researcher, but um, certainly you know active in the conversation on mental health. And then Gabor, I mean, he's really the only person I saw that made kind of the transition from like high academia and like um, kind of the 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 uh, the place where like all the experts hang out. And then penetrated the the general public like he was on joe rogan he was talking to prince harry he's you know having larger conversations in the world and he's doing great work and i think that he's he really in the pandemic was especially was someone who took off in a big way so the pandemic the lockdown changed the landscape for the first time um you can build a public career that's not dependent on tv media outlets publishers, the academy, or larger organizations. This is good and bad, right? Because it democratized being able to have a voice and speak into the conversation on, on mental health, but also people weren't being vetted. There's lots of people who have risen to the top and they weren't vetted by the academy or they're, you know, by professionals. And you have some rogues, you know, some cowboys and cowgirls out there that, that uh, are kind of polarizing. You know, so really like it's it's kind of a new territory. It's the Wild West right now as far as what it looks like. So here's here's how I kind of saw as far as like therapist content creator, you know, kind of economic models, as far as like how you make money, how you kind of live. There's there's 
I see four main options. There's more, obviously, but there's there's main options. Like most people are doing monthly subscription programs, you know, so you have like content, community, access to like premiere stuff. So kind of once you gain a following, you kind of move that following into uh, like a monthly subscription. Um, most of them are priced around 29 bucks, um, maybe a few bucks above or less. That's pretty industry standard. So that's that's what I see most people doing. Um, some people like myself go into these one-time purchase workshops. That's on the right there. That's workshops, courses, classes. You're going to see those priced pretty typically around like 39 to 69 bucks. Sometimes the larger courses might get up to like 300, but you don't see tons above that. In coaching, you'll see these big $2,000 courses, $1,600 courses. Um, I haven't seen a lot of therapist folks, you know, go to that because accessibility is a big value. I think for a lot of therapists, I think a lot of folks who are really trying to do this work, you know, from a content creator side, care about getting the message out, you know, so that's a big value. Uh, book. Yeah, I think most everyone is going that book route, at, at least in part. So Julie, Dr. Julie, she's gone, you know, 100% into the book. Um, and yeah, and then YouTube podcast revenue, that's folks like Huberman. Um, there's, there's several folks who have really leveraged YouTube because that has, you know, revenue kind of built into it. And then brand deals that hasn't gone away. That's still, that's still there. We're going to talk a lot about the ethics of if that's cool or not. If you do brand deals, we're going to talk about that, but podcasting certainly is, is a huge place, um, where people have grown as well. So here's, here's how I kind of see the economics of it. This is the part that I think a lot of people don't really get into it for this reason. But it's worth talking about, and I think it's worth settling kind of early on what your economic goal is. And here's why. I think the content creator model for therapists is really what is your mission? And then how do you want to connect with your audience? And that's going to determine your economic option. And, and this isn't really just about trying to get rich or trying to make much money. The profit is, are the, that's the resources you use to fuel your mission. You know, like I have a seven person team. Now, like I, I have, like I said, 200,000 people who are coming in and out of my courses. Like I need tech support. I need people who are like helping and <laughs> uh, helping build these websites and helping me edit videos. Like you need a team, you know? And so the profit is to scale how big and how large your message can go. It's not just, I think people kind of are short sighted. It's like, oh, you're just trying to get rich off of, you know, people's mental health. And it's like, one, I don't think there's anything wrong with wanting to be rich, uh, but, but two, I, I think that for, for the vast majority of us, that's not really the reason we're in here and trying to do this. It's because we want to scale our operation, which takes a team so that the message can get out and people can, people can find healing and people can find some of the information that's going to save their relationships. That's going to save their lives. It really does, I think, have power to do that. And so that's, that's why it matters. And I think that the reality is, depending on the economic option that you find appealing, um, you can, I don't know, you, you can really build your, your brand or your, build your platform in different ways. For example, if you want to be an author, if you're here because you're like, gosh, I, I really don't want to do social media thing. It's kind of cringy. I'm not like a look at me like da, 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 da. And I don't really have time to do all this. I don't have time to be trying to make all these social media content and going viral. That's just not your personality. If you want a writing career where it's not about your face being, you know, plastered on a big stage, you would, I don't know, it sounds fun for you to maybe have like, I don't know, uh, op-eds and big publications or have like a column where you can talk about mental health or to contribute to publications, to contribute to like, I don't know, the Atlantic or uh, the New York Times. If, if you want to write and have best-selling books, like you want to be able to work part-time and then write on the side. If that sounds like a fun, just rhythm, maybe not even forever, but just for a season of your career, then you're probably going to pursue a writing forward approach to your social media. Meaning, you know, there's the option to do videos and reels and YouTube, but you are probably going to either do a podcast or you're going to do, you know, writing on Instagram. That's the new blog, by the way. For those of you who remember blogging, like Instagram is the new blogging. That tile that you see there, we're going to talk a lot about the strategy behind this. That tile is like your, it's your hypothesis. It's your topic. It's your like, it's your title of what you want to talk about. And then that caption, that's your blog. And people read those. People do. People really connect with it. People will check in every day to see what you posted on Instagram to read your caption. You have a chance to really connect with people and to have a relationship with them through your writing. And, and I think a lot of the same way that people who used to write for newspapers or people who wrote or did public radio had a relationship with their audience as well. This is the new platform. And like I said, it's not about you anymore. It's not about 
look at me. I'm the big professional. I'm the expert. I'm so great. That's the influencer model. And I think a lot of us are kind of caught up in our egos. I really think that's it. We're caught up in our egos. Like, gosh, like I just, it doesn't really feed me. It doesn't really like fill me up to like try to just promote myself. And I'm terrible at self-promotion. I'm like, don't promote yourself, promote your mission. For me, it's healing trauma. That's like, I'm obsessed with wanting to know that. What for me, when you see that, like I made a million dollars in sales, I've invested more than half of that into my education. I've paid hundreds of thousands of dollars to consult with some of the like leading trauma experts in the world to have them watch my videos. What I pay for, what I use that money for is literally like, I'll have them like watch my counseling sessions. Like we're watching tapes, like in the old football days, like I used to play football in high school and we would watch tapes of our games and we'd be like, all right, what happened in that play? When did he come? What happened there? What, what could we do better? I do that with Frank Anderson. So Frank Anderson, he's a specialist in internal family systems. He's like one of the leading premier trauma therapists in the world. You know, so something we've been done for, for the past two years is he will watch my therapy sessions. I got consent forms and, and you know, and, and talk to my clients about it. Um, we'll watch it. And then line by line, he's coaching me on IFS. He's like, what did you do there? Did you see the body posture change? Did you do this? Like, did you notice they took a breath? Like, why'd you ask that question? Why didn't you do this? My goodness. I didn't know how valuable having something like a social media platform would be just for the development of my own personal skill set. Like for me, high value for me is like, I want to bring expertise and theoretically sound insight to the public. It's not just the Matthias show. It's not just trying to get famous. I'm really not super interested in that. I'm, I'm a little interested in that because I'm extroverted and I like seeing people and it's kind of fun. But the reality is like, I like feeling like I'm doing something helpful for people. Like what I'm telling people is actually like, I can feel confident that it's not just my best guess. It's like, it's what the, it's, it's grounded in something that we, that the closest thing we know to something being true is possible. So yeah, I've invested that money into just my own personal development. Did the same thing with David Kessler past three, four months. I've been meeting about three times a week with David Kessler. Some of you know him. He's the guy who runs grief.com. He's probably the leading grief specialist in the world. He, you know, those stages of grief, um, you know, uh, bargaining and acceptance, all that. So he co-wrote that book with Kugler Ross. And he's, I mean, he's the best there is in grief, right? I've been meeting with him three times a week. And he's been training me in a very similar capacity. I've been helping him with his groups. I've been running tech support for his groups, helping him with like getting people situated on Zoom and getting into their like, uh, just, just like pretty like mundane things because I want to learn. And he's one of the best. I'm doing something similar with um, uh, Dini, Dini Leotis with EMDR. Um, have a similar kind of, you know, like arrangement where I'm helping with media stuff and um, making sure that I can learn from one of the best how to do EMDR. So like, I don't think a lot of people see that on the outside. It was like, oh, I was doing social media. It's all kind of vain. It's all kind of about me. It's about my ego. And then I'm just trying to get famous. And I'm like, that's so short-sighted. It's so not that. You can, what social media has allowed me to do is have access to some incredible mentorship that's that's crafted my area of expertise at a rate that I wouldn't have been able to do without. I mean, having direct access to some of these people is incredible, and having you know the economic ability to to uh, to uh, to get that is 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 something that's it's a it's a big privilege, and so I'm, then I'm trying to be wise with that and take that and give it away for free to the general public. You know, and even these workshops, it's like really accessible, like really like low price ranges just for kind of larger, you know, kind of pieces of work. But I think that that's, that's what's in front of you. That's what you could do. And I know some of you listening right now are thinking like, okay, well, I'm, I'm here to kind of learn how to like advertise for my group practice. Like he's kind of talking about being this content creator. That's not really relevant to me. I kind of want to do my group practice. I honestly think that some of this is more relevant to you than you might think. And here's, if, if I was just giving you a suggestion, let's say that you're running a practice right now. You have maybe a dozen or so therapists under you and you're like, no, no, no. I just want to like build my like Williamson County family practice brand. Like, I just want to know how to get some more followers so I can get more clients. And I'm like, the, the reality is if, if I were you, if that was me, I would be giving, you know, an event like this, I'd be taking my therapists, you know, in my practice to an event like this and then empowering them to build their own individual, you know, platforms on social media, if they're interested in that, not everyone is. But if they wanted to do that, because here's what happened at my family practice. When I first started out, when I first started doing this, um, <laughs> I'm a little embarrassed to say it, but I, so I was, 
I was brand new at this family practice is is right out of my internship. And I had this office under the stairs that was, I don't know, I don't think it was actually correctly zoned to be an office, to be totally honest with you. I think it was a broom closet and there's no ventilation. Um, it got hot really quickly. And I was like knee to knee with my client. I would literally be like touching my knees with my client. And we're in this tiny room. So I'm like, so what do you need to talk about? And I started posting on TikTok and I, I had a pretty rapid, you know, kind of hockey stick into the public eye. And my, uh, the owner of my practice came to me one day and she was just like, okay, so Matthias, I know you've been telling us you've been doing stuff on TikTok. I'm like, yeah, yeah. She's like, we might need to take you off our website. And I'm like, why? I'm like, we can't make outgoing calls. What do you mean? Well, every time we put the phone down, we pick it up and it's someone who rang asking to get in to you for counseling. I'm like what? He's like, yeah, it's been two weeks and your, um, your wait list is at over 2000 people. I'm like, uh oh, and, and I was like, super like, oh God, what in the world? Now, what we did is we spread out those clients to other people in the practice. And so immediately everyone's caseloads were full. You know, like I can't take 2000 people. So the reality is like you, by using this technology and empowering even the clients in your practice, that's going to be the thing that benefits your, every time people Google me, right. You know, my group practice comes up in the SEO. Like you, you might be here is like, oh, what are some SEO strategies? Meaning like, how do I get on the first Google page? Like if you Google something, how do I come up first on the page? And I'm like, I'll tell you what, the best thing ever happened to that group practice is SEO was just me blowing up on TikTok. And it still is, it's still, they're still blowing up for that reason. And so the reality is it's not just like, oh, how do I create posts for, you know, like I said, the county practice, yada, yada, yada. I'm like, there's, there's more on the table here than you might be seeing. And that's empowering, I think, the people at your practice to be able to maybe even reach people with their message, with the unique thing that they have to bring to the table, with their voice. And that's only going to benefit everyone who's connected to them. So um, something to think about. Mm, all right. Let's do some Q&A. Let's start there. I just talked a lot, but I'm curious what people are thinking, what people are wondering. We have a lot today. Like I said, we're going to be moving into the ethics, like the how to um, of this uh, here in a little bit. We're kind of starting in like kind of the business um, spot. By the way, yeah, if you um, if you're interested at all in uh, these group um, consultations, like I said, it's it's cool. Like we're, what we're doing, we're starting in January and uh, we're going to be doing three months, essentially just meeting every week. And then someone's going to bring a piece of social media content up that they've made. We're going to critique. We're going to give feedback. We're going to be doing stuff. We're going to tell them how to make it better. And we're all just going to kind of support each other and make everyone um, as successful as we possibly can. Then there's a Facebook group. We all get together in that. And then I'm going to be really active in that Facebook group, giving content and kind of feedback on stuff. People are going to be posting what they're thinking, even like ethical quandaries. That's, a, that's something else that's going to be really cool about it. If people are like, oh, I just got a DM about someone, you know, that I don't know, is suicidal. Like, what do I do in that circumstance? You actually have people that are in that space to like reference with. And then you can document that you consulted with like 10 therapists, you know, on what to do there because you're in that group and you can have contact with those people. And that's going to really bolster not just your approach, but it's also going to bolster your documentation and your security as you handle some of these ethical things. So that's pretty cool. Um, it's just a three month program too. So we're, we're starting in January. It's going to be weekly. Um, and you can go to that if you're interested in something like that. I think it'd be really fun. Um, okay, let's get some questions. So I think the if we could get the the question um, button in there. Oh, went too far ahead. There we go. There's the Q&A. The Q&A button was just brought up. And so you have two options there. You can type in a question or you can press that little thumbs up, like we said, and that votes on a question. So if there's a question that you're like, oh, that's really cool, you can check that out. And um, um, we can do that. All right, first question right up, right up top. What are your thoughts on trauma-informed coaches who are not licensed therapists on social media? <laughs> uh, uh, this is why I'm doing this course. Please make social media accounts so that we can have really like trained and incredible uh, therapists who know what they're talking about, who are who are in the public eye uh, speaking into these conversations. That would just be great. 
Does that answer your question? I think there's some incredible trauma-informed coaches out there um, who have really done their work to get training. You can see it. Here's how you tell who's who's doing a good job and not. They'll say in their bio, they'll say in their website, I have done IFS level one. I have done somatic experiencing this. I have gone on this retreat and done this. They are super passionate about telling you where they've done their training. I trust those people. I do. Um, if they don't have that, man, there's some there's some folks out there who are traumatizing people. And I think it's it's almost evil um, what some people are saying. That's uh that's that's what I'm talking about though. That's like the wild west. Um people aren't being vetted. People can rise into the public eye without being vetted. And so you got some great folks who have a platform that I don't know, would have taken a long time for like for me, like it would take a long time for me to go through Harvard and you know, or this or that, and then kind of like rise up the ranks to be able to have a platform like I do now. I've had a lot quicker. Now I've had to backtrack and then make sure that I'm actually getting the consultation and have the people in my camp that are making sure I'm I'm crafting my expertise. Not everyone has that value. There's a lot of people who don't. And so um, I'm not downing on all trauma-informed coaches. I'm saying there's high risk and there are trustworthy people, but please, therapists who are listening, who are even a little interested in this, um, we need your voice. We need you here. So that's all into that. All right, uh, this is great. Starting from scratch with social media, what would be your first go-to action? That's the next section. So the next hour, I'm going all through that. I have 10 tips for what you should do first. It's going to be a lot. So I think I'll answer your question in that. So feel free to ask questions later if you have specifics on that, but I'm right about to go there. Yeah, I'm feeling a bit um, intimidated about the technology side of things. Do you have any suggestions? This is great. So here's... um. The reality, everyone starts with not knowing how to navigate the app. Everyone starts with not knowing how to edit a video, how to uh, do lighting and audio. We all start from the beginning at some point. For me, I was a wedding photographer, you know, for several years. That's how I paid my way through my master's program. So I knew how to work a camera. And then I worked at Guitar Center uh, for my bachelor's. <laughs> I was in guitars. Um, so I did audio stuff with with guitars and music and so I knew how to do audio engineering just because I worked at that job and then with photography I knew how to work shutter speeds and aperture and work with lighting and that's why you have like such a pretty background back here just I know how to light it that's because I did photography you know so the reality is you're you're gonna have to spend time on each of these individual um pieces of skill it's it's like these skills of how to navigate these things but as i'll say in the next section my suggestion would be start by just using your phone don't buy a camera you don't have to figure out how to buy a camera and do lighting don't worry about that um sit stand in front of a window or sit in front of a window um have a little bit of space behind you and your chair so you notice i'm not against a wall right so you have like a big background back there like you have a little bit of distance and space it feels more welcoming it feels easier on the eyes to look at and that's your set you don't need a big set like if you're doing videos you don't need a big set sit in front of a window, a little bit of space behind you, get your phone. You don't have to do anything. And then edit inside the app. What I mean by that is within TikTok, within Instagram, you can actually put the video right into the app. And then in the app, you'll see that there's different options. And on YouTube, there's incredible tutorials about how to work the app. And you're going to start simple. You don't need big, flashy, crazy subtitles. You don't need big, flashy, crazy um, effects, transitions in a video. That's just not the reality, I think most videos that go viral on TikTok and Instagram, is just someone talking in their phone, holding their phone, talking, bad lighting, bad audio, authenticity. Like I said, influencer world was all polished. Creator world, authentic. So I think the bar for the technology thing is actually lower than you might think, because we've been in this world where it, everything had to be high production. We're not in high production world anymore. We're in authentic world. I do production because I like it. I think it's fun. Like I said, I did Guitar Center. I did photography. So I just do it because I enjoy it. I actually think my brand would not be hurt at all if I just started using my phone. Um, it might even be benefited a little bit, honestly. Um, so I hope that gives you a little bit of a deep breath. You really just, and I'd start with one platform. You don't have to do on everything. Just figure out Instagram, record with your phone, start with Instagram. That's all you have to go with. And then you'll add layer by layer what to do after that. So I can answer that more specifically later if you need, but that's what I'd say. Hmm. 
Ah, next question. All right, sure. <clears throat> uh, what kind of camera equipment do you use? And approximate cost. Your set looks so YouTube professional and crystal clear. So like I said, I would recommend you don't do what I do. I know, I know I'm speaking out of, I don't know, I'm being a hypocrite, but like, please start with your phone. Like, like hear me there. Like, it's so much better if you're not leaning on production value to get views and to get attention. You're leaning on the substance of what you're saying. I think there's a better lesson in that, okay? So if you're starting out, please don't buy a camera. And if you're starting out, please don't buy a, um, a uh, cropped sensor camera. Um, and okay, so let's talk about gears a little bit. Because I know that there's some people who are here who are kind of medium. You've been doing this for a little bit. You've been trying and you want to upgrade your gears. I'm not going to hold back on you. I'll just tell you exactly what I have. Um, I'm not a tech expert in everything. I, I know some things, but here's, I'll give you the quick, if you want to jot down some notes, here's, here's what I use. Uh, my camera that you're looking at right here is something called a Canon 6D Mark II. Canon 6D Mark II. Okay. I use a 35 millimeter lens. 35 millimeter lens. I think it's Sigma. I think the Sigma 35 millimeter lens. That's what I use. That's my camera. Um, I alternatively have another camera that I use sometimes. That's a um, Canon 5D Mark IV. Canon 5D Mark IV. And this light to my right is an aperture light. I think it's the aperture, I forget the actual specific one. It really doesn't matter. Lights, lights, it, lights don't matter at all. I, 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 I promise you, you just need something that's like a little bit warm. Like don't get something that's like super blue and like fluorescent. And uh, like those ring lights sometimes can be really just blue and they wash you out and you kind of look like pale and like a zombie. Um, do something a little bit warmer. I mean, I mean, you can tell like my my vibe is all warm, you know, so that's what I do. Uh, I, I also like um, these lights here. I have one right here. What's it called? The GVM. G is in go. G V is in Victor M. And that's a uh, what is this thing? Mm. trying to look for a model number all right here it is the gvm this is just a big number this is so useless all right we're going to move on after this but it's the gvm y three zero d one six zero really catchy really catchy name huh really easy to to search up really easy just to kind of log away in the back of your brain everyone can remember that right okay the GVM, I'm going to say it one more time if you're writing it down, Y30D160. All right, that is the, uh, I would, those are cheap lights. It's a hundred bucks for that light. Buy that. It's it's great. You can put it up just top right, all right? And it, it does fine. I have one underneath because uh, I have a brow that kind of pulls over a little bit. And so I needed some under light so I don't look super tired and depressed all the time. Um, so I have an aperture light. Those are really expensive. Don't buy that one. It's super expensive. Um, I bought it impulsively when a course did really well and I wanted to treat myself and it's giant and everyone walks into my office and is like, why do you have that big old umbrella light? You think you're some movie star? And I'm like, I don't know. I could probably do the same thing with a hundred dollar light, but I spent too much money on this dumb light and I love it. Um, <laughs> but it's so over the top and pointless. Don't buy it. Um, do the hundred dollar light and uh that's that's what i'd say okay we can get into more tech stuff if people have more specific questions but i have a, a 60 off to the side if you're looking at my desk i have a 60 here where i do my TikToks and my instagrams that's vertical i actually record vertical um i have a teleprompter on there and i just use my phone um we'll get into this a little bit later too but i honestly bought like a 15 dollar teleprompter off of amazon the teleprompter is just a mirror. It's just like a case. It's a mirror. It has a little like thing that holds your phone. And then I use the teleprompter app on my phone and I write my scripts. Yeah, we'll talk about that. I write my scripts for my videos and I press play on the teleprompter. And then it's a teleprompter has a mirror. It's a one way mirror that's over the camera. So you can look and read your script. Right. But it looks like you're looking at the lens. It looks like you're looking at the video. Um, it's great. It, it works really well. And that's what I do. And that's what Julie does, by the way, Dr. Julie. 
And I think that's also what Nicole does. And that's what therapy Jeff does. I'm most people are going that direction. Teleprompting is the way of the future. I used to memorize everything for about three years. I memorized every single script, write it out every word, memorized it word for word. I'll talk about why I used to do that a little bit later. Um, and then I memorize it and then I'd recite it. it just took a long time, you know, so I'm at the point now where it's a little bit faster for me to be able to write it out, teleprompt it and then read it. Um, so that's, that's time saving. And I think it's been positive by the way. Um, I'll, if, if you're in the group, if you're like in our consultation group, I'm happy to like, even just like give you an Amazon list of all the different things that I have. Um, and, and this would go for like my speakers. Um, I have some soundproofing stuff. Like I have like some essentially like what's called a cloud. It's like a cushion up top that makes sure the sound is really good. I'll tell you what, like this microphone, this is an SM7B microphone, by the way. Um, I have what's called an ATM mini extreme pro. That's what allows me to stream this. So I can give you like that full list of everything and exactly what I have. So you can buy my exact system if you want to, um, that would probably be more appropriate for the groups. Um, and then I can even answer questions there too. If you need help setting it up or something, I actually made a video for David Kessler, poor guy. I, I gave him my whole list and, uh, for, cause he wanted to do something similar. And then he just told me, he's like, this is too hard. And then I sent him a video walking him through how to set it up. And he's like, you spoke too fast. And I'm like, okay, I'll just fly to LA and hook it up for you, David. So poor guy. All right. Um, that's enough on gear. Here's the thing. I know gear talk is either super boring to listen to, or it's like imperative. People are like dying to hear about it. So I, I get that. I get that. All right. This is a good one. What are the ethics around being a therapist online under an alias? If you're too nervous to use your real name, I'm so scared of doxing and have had stalkers in the past. Yes. Do that. That's a great idea. Uh, Nadia had a big problem with a stalker. And she's talked a bit about that. That that is that is a real thing. So I'm going to talk about some ways to be safe and some things to do to protect your privacy. I have things that I do there. Um, I can go to a little bit here. I mean, I think so. For example, some things that I do. Um, I do use my name. I think people will discover your name even if you use an alias. So even if you use like you know Rising Woman or Holistic Psychologist or something like people will kind of find out what your name is, unless you're writing, unless you kind of use an alias, kind of like, and it's just writing, you never use your face. That's a fine way to do it. Um, you're going to have trouble because people won't connect to you as well. People do want to see your face and you will grow faster if you have a personal element in your brand. Um, I don't know of anyone. Yeah. I don't know of anyone at the top that they've successfully concealed their name. Um, I think that in order to kind of grow, you do need to have a dimension of personal um, access to who you are as a person. People don't want to form a relationship with ChatGPT. You know, they don't they don't want to worry that you're just a bot somewhere and there's some Russian helping them through their trauma. Nothing against Russians. Just saying, there's Russian troll farms that that are known for um, I don't know making a fuss on social media. So, yeah. Um, okay, a couple of privacy things. I can say this real quick now. We can come back to it later if we need. Uh, I don't photograph my kids. You're not going to find my kids online. Um, you, you're not even going to find my wife online. So some people like are weird about that. They're like, oh, your marriage must be in trouble because you never post about your wife. And I'm like, no, my wife is is really hot. She's super beautiful. And that would be a problem with 2 million people. I'm just, I want to protect her privacy. And I want, she's asked me that. She's asked me to you know, not post about her online. And so uh, I respect that. And I want her to feel comfortable. I don't want her to feel like she's out in public and people are looking at her thinking like, oh, is that her? Especially if she's out with the kids by herself. So there's just some like elements there about being in the public that I'm going to protect as long as I can. Um, <laughs> sorry if that was awkward. I'd, yeah, I I'd, I'd, I'd really, uh, I really care about her, my daughter, my son. Don't want them to feel that pressure. So that's what I do on that front. And then um, some other stuff stalker-wise. Um, I created a business under um, a different location than my house. And so if you search online for like Matthias J. Barker, you're not seeing my house. Um, there's also steps you can take to actually get your number and your address removed from like the public registry. You can do that depending on where you live in the world. So those steps can be taken. I think ultimately though, um, the things that I do to protect privacy the best are uh, not photo, really keeping, you only see me against this background. Like 
you're not necessarily seeing me in my house, like where I'm at, where I'm around. You're not seeing me in my story, talking in my backyard where you can see like, oh, where are the houses that are around there? Um, I, I'll, I'll tell you that it's not uh, unheard of to have stalkers, especially if you're female. Um, but generally, I think, especially in this world, the kind of content you're making is really attracting mostly a demographic of middle-aged women. So the uh, my demographics are 75% middle-aged women and then like 25% men. I have the most men of anyone in the field. Like we've all looked at our demographics together. Uh, someone like Julie, Nicole, Michelin, I mean, they have 90% women. So you're really, as far as like what kind of space you're in, you're pretty safe. Now, if you're doing, if you were like a gamer, if you were like a video game YouTuber, you might be more concerned. But I don't know if like Susan, who's 55 and I don't know, she's coming to try to find your house. I don't, I don't think she's trying to find you. I think you're all right. There's still a little bit of risk there, but that's, that's how I think about it. And then feel free, do we have the option to comment under these two? All right, if anyone's listening on the tech side, if you can open up commenting on the q and I think sometimes people have like little nuances on questions that they like answered to. I think that's helpful for me if we can open that up and then you can kind of comment underneath if there's a specific angle to a question you wanna be able to talk about. Let's have about five more minutes of questions and then we'll get into uh, strategies for growth. I'm excited to get there. Any questions about the group too? Any questions about the group consultations, anything there? Happy to. Happy to talk about it. All right. If you're wanting to create slash offer digital seminars, ebooks, etc., do you recommend focusing first on developing these or growing following, growing a following first, or trying to do both at the same time? Great question. Um, I think that building a social media following first is going to be a better bet. Here's what I see a lot of people do. They spend like two, 3,000 bucks to some camera guy to film this really high quality Netflix level course. And then they have no one to sell it to. And then they try to do a webinar and they have like 11 people show up. And then they pitch it and then no one buys it. And then they're really discouraged and then they give up. I, I'm not exaggerating. I've, I've run across that like over a dozen times. That's that's the worst possible way you can go about it, I think. I think that, one, your first course should cost you nothing. It should be over Zoom. It should be with your webcam on your computer. And you should pay $0 for your first. Th there should be no initial cost. Um, my first course that I did was over Instagram Live. I created an Instagram account and I made it private. And then if you bought tickets through my Squarespace website, then I'd let you in. You could follow that private account and then I was going to go live at a certain time on that private account. And that's how I like Jimmy rigged my first course. And it was on my phone camera and I paid off my student loans in one day. It was great. I was just, it was wild, but that's because I also built a following first. Like, and I think that if you're going to put attention into anything, the benefit of putting it into um, your following is you're going to learn what your audience wants to hear from you. You may think that like, oh, I'm here to talk about anxiety. And then that's not at all what people want to hear from you. It turns out you kind of aren't good at talking about anxiety. No one thinks what you're saying is very deep. No one thinks what you're saying is very helpful. But when you talk about people pleasing, good golly, people are just like, will fall over, you know, forwards to try to get to your course and to, to hear what you have to say. And you didn't know. Turns out all your best analogies have to do with people pleasing and your personality, your face, whatever attracts the people pleasers. Good for you. Um, for me, I cast a really wide net at the beginning. I was talking about motivation. I was talking about uh, recovering from pornography. I was talking about um, marriage. I was talking about uh, finding a mentor. Ver no one wanted to hear about most of that. People wanted to hear about trauma from me. I It was not necessarily my goal to become a trauma therapist at the beginning, but all my content on trauma started going viral. And then that's when I started getting really anxious because I'm like, I don't know a lot about trauma. And uh, so then that's when I called up Frank Anderson. And, um, and that's when I started like consulting and going to workshops and, and, uh, people loved my couple stuff. Uh, so I went pretty big on Gottman Institute. I started, I did the level one and level two at Gottman. And then I started like reaching out to the Gottman Institute and like reposting their stuff. And, 
Uh, we started to build a relationship. And so a lot of my couple stuff has to do with Gottman. So uh, here's, here's the reality. This, is, this wasn't the question, but this is worth knowing. The hardest niches to be successful in, I think, is one, men. Men don't care about social media content. They care about motivation, uh, performance, uh, entrepreneurialism. So Huberman is big with men because he's science driven. If you're going to try to appeal to men, I think that you need to go through science. You need to go through practical step-by-step, -step, how to achieve, how to go up the hierarchy. I know that those feel like big generalizations. Obviously there's men who aren't like motivated by that, but I'll just tell you from experience that the majority of men are, are going after those types of people. Like the, the Holy grail, of like men's focused mental health content is really like atomic habits with james clear huberman lab joe rogan like and i know that some of us might cringe at some of you know what's up with joe rogan but i will say that he's platformed like guys like gabor mate there was like millions of men who have never heard anything about trauma that got to listen to three hours of what gabor mate had to say because of joe rogan thank god for that um you know like it's it's incredible and and so I think that there's a lot of psychologists that he's brought on that, I mean, you might have qualms. I get it. Like we might have qualms with some of that, but uh, a lot of men were reached by that. Uh, folks like um, Jonathan Haidt, um, Steven Pinker. They're just, I think men are more research focused and stats and uh, Paul Bloom. You know, those are those, if you're looking at like, oh, I want to reach men, look at those guys. I think look at Paul Bloom, uh, Sam Harris. Uh, those are Those are the folks who have built a career off of doing something with men. And women, uh, I think, are a lot more gravitated towards mental health content. We could have a cultural conversation around why that is. I don't know. Um, I have guesses. But uh, the reality is that your demographic is likely going to be uh, middle-aged women, some younger women. Relationships is really hard, too. If you're going to build a marriage-focused, couples-focused brand, you're in for a hard time. I, I think that it's there's so many of them. And for whatever reason, the pain point isn't really sensational enough to go buy a course in a lot of cases. The people who have been successful at it, folks like the Gottman Institute, they've done great on their own. You know, like they're, they're doing really good. Esther Perel, obviously. Like uh, there are people who have done incredible stuff there, but <laughs> the problem is with marriage, you're trying to get the men involved too. <laughs> like that's, that's the problem is the men. Uh, they, uh, they don't want to go to the couple's workshop thing with their wife. Like they don't want to go to that thing that the influencer was saying that's just I I mean I'm not saying that's the way it should be don't misunderstand me there I'm I'm saying that's been my experience and so I think that if you were picking what your niche is going to be uh at the beginning go really wide do ADHD do motivation do uh eating disorders do trauma do this that and the other um what you're going to find I think is that you will have a voice in one of those things that resonates with your audience and it might not be what you expect and then specialize in it, become the very best at that thing. And it doesn't have to just be one thing. You don't have to have just an ADD account or something. Um, but some things that are congruent within that space that are going to give you a voice at the table in the spaces that you want to be. That's, again, where the economic goal is going to be really important. If you want to build a speaking career, you know, if you want to be at the networker next year, giving your breakout, you know, talking about your area of expertise, you know, build your platform around that. You know, and it's not just, oh, I'm, I'm specializing in EMDR. Or I'm specializing in, you know, polyvagal. It, zoom out. You're specializing in trauma. Or you're specializing in complex trauma. Or you're specializing in um, divorce. You know, like you, you, you kind of pick the pain point as the emphasis, not necessarily the like academic title. Does that make sense? Okay. Here's, um, here's what would be helpful. If anyone on the tech side is open, Let's open up the chat so people can talk, because sometimes when I'm answering these questions, it's helpful for, to me to see if I'm landing with folks and if I'm answering the question or if people have kind of nuanced responses. They're like, well, I was really asking this or that. And that gives me sometimes kind of a read just to make sure I'm answering them well. So that's that's what I'll say on that one. OK, let's move on from Q&A and get to some strategies from growth. Does that sound does that sound all right? OK. Um, I'm excited. All right, we'll close out that. Boom, strategies for growth. You have this in your notes. Here's my first piece of advice. Again, this section here, this is really focused on how to grow. Next session is going to be on how to do this ethically. 
So if you've signed up for this ethics talk, someone's like, we haven't talked about ethics yet. Where is that? Know that we're in a sandwich, like I said before. We have the like strategy, the business advice, the technical advice up front. And then the bulk, the majority of our day is going to be going through uh, federal trade laws. We're going to be talking about ethics. We're going to be talking about um, SWOT analysis. And we're going to be talking about uh, disclosure forms. So all that's coming. I just wanted to kind of like, again, it kind of sandwich it, start and stop with some more practical step-by-step -step kind of technical advice. Because I think, you know, everyone's here for something a little bit different. So I'm hoping this is engaging. I, I certainly love talking about it. So, all right. So this is about how to grow. Next section, all right, in about uh, 45 minutes, an hour, we're going to start kind of diving into the ethics. This is a really practical step-by-step -step too. This isn't going to be conceptual and like philosophical as much as like technically here's how you do it. And I really need to tell you right before we dive in. This is really kind of for the person starting out under 10,000 followers. You're going to see if you're like at 50,000, 100,000, if, if you're here and you've kind of already gotten started and you feel stuck, I think you're going to notice that there's a few of these things here that you haven't been doing. And I really recommend you try doing them. So um, this is like kind of a good checklist of like, oh, am I doing all these things? This is a list that I've collected from multiple influencers, multiple content creators that have been in this space. And I've seen them work and they're things that I've done. And some of them I've leaned more into at different seasons than others. Uh, but I have seen them work. And so if you're like, ah, oh, I'm posting a lot, because here's the worst part. The worst thing ever would be to spend hours doing this. And then it's not working. And you, you're what? You're spending like five, seven hours a week writing things and you're getting like two likes and it's been like two years and nothing came of it. Like that would be a bummer. So, uh, you know, if you're going to put the time into it, do it right. Do it with, you know, looking at it from multiple angles. Here's what I also say. This is going to feel overwhelming. This is going to feel like a lot if you're starting out. I'm certainly not recommending you do everything. All right. Um, did we get the chat on? Were we able to get the chat on for everybody so people can dive in? Okay, cool. Yes. All right, David, I see you. That's great. Um, all right. So here, here's like, I want you to know, pick two. If you're starting out with this, just pick two. You're going to look at this and be like, oh my gosh, this is too much. I can't do this. This is way too you know, technical. This is way too much to do. I don't have time for this. I have a full-time canceling load. Here's, here's what I did. I was seeing... 30 clients a week. Um, and I had 2 million followers before I went full-time into social media. All right. So I built a platform up to 2 million followers in my spare time. This is meant to be done within five hours a week. If you did everything, if you did everything I'm telling you to do, we're talking five to seven hours a week. And if you, did, if you wanted, if you didn't have five to seven hours a week, you can do this in two or three hours. I'm going to show you how to do it. This is going to feel like a lot, but I promise when you, once you get into the routine, this is not going to take over your life. It didn't take over mine. And like I said, I got the 2 million before I went full time. Um, the, the, the laborious part of the courses, <laughs> the laborious part is workshops, courses, writing a book. Social media is not the laborious part. It, it can feel strenuous when you're getting started, but once you have a system in place, you're going to be all right. So here's my system. Pick two things. Don't get overwhelmed. All right. Um, here we go. Strategies for growth. You have your notes out. You ready? Follow who you want to emulate. You got to do some research at the beginning. Um, when you're starting out with piano, you learn lessons from Mozart. When you're starting out with cooking, you do recipes. You do the same thing with social media. All right. It's, it's the truth. Um, you want what you want to look for is who has the kind of platform that you would like to have and who's aligned with your message and your mission find someone that's like oh i can get on board with that i like their approach i like what they're doing i, I if i could do what they're doing that's great you are going to study their method you're going to read through all their posts all their captions all their tweets if you're starting out with this do it for like 30 minutes a day you don't have to get started right away there's no there's no timer you know like like oh i got to get posting i got to mix up i got to get going no Take, take a few months and just do some R&R. &R. Um, read through the captions, tweets. This will change entirely how you approach it, I promise. Watch all their content. I did this religiously. I, I followed, I think, 5,000 therapists on Instagram when I first started out. And I read through a majority of the things that I could find. I would spend about an hour a day over the course of about six months reading through hashtag mental health, hashtag couples, hashtag trauma, hashtag ADD, and just seeing what were the videos that were performing well what what's going on this is a step i think people forget about but it's kind of self-evident you got to study and, and what you're studying here again is not 
their content, you're studying their method. Here's, if you're gonna learn anything from this, um, underline this and take this note. It's not, content goes viral, not because the idea is good, but because it's presented well. I wish this was not the truth. Can I be honest with you? There are so many bad ideas that go viral. So many. There's so many tweets, so many videos, so much advice that has millions of views and it's destructive to people. It's like the worst advice. I wish I could tell you that if you just had the best ideas in the world, you're going to go viral and you're going to like grow and it's going to be incredible just because you're, it's such good quality. It's not the truth. The truth is people who go viral present it well. There is a language. Think about it like this. If you were counseling people and you were speaking the wrong language, you're not going to help your client. If you, if, if they weren't understanding your vocabulary, you're not, they're not going to be helped. And you can think, well, is something wrong with my ideas or something wrong with my use of IFS? It's like, no, people don't know what a firefighter is. People don't know what, what the, like you're using vocabulary or language that they don't understand. And sometimes we forget what it's like to not understand these ideas. We forget what it's like to not know what an I feel statement is, to not know that we need to take a deep breath, to not know that we need to take a break when we're in a high conflict, to not know what a boundary is. And I think therapists jump on and they recapitulate their textbooks. They recapitulate, I don't know, their, their trainings. No one knows what the heck they're talking about. That's what I did for months. I was, I was just recapitulating my textbooks and, and no one watches it for good reason because no one knows what you're talking about. So you have to study the method, the language in different apps have different languages, different dialects. I don't know if you knew that. Like TikTok, very Gen Z driven. Instagram, very millennial driven. Facebook, pretty actually millennial and boomer driven, like and Gen X. You'd be surprised. My Facebook's blowing up right now. I'm gaining almost 10,000 a week. And it's all millennials. I was like, what millennials still using Facebook? Okay, well, hey, fine. That's good and fine. I'm, I'll, I'll take it. You know, so they have a totally different language. And I'll tell you, videos that do well on Facebook don't do well on TikTok. And videos that do well on TikTok don't do well on Facebook. It's super weird. I'll have a video go viral, get... 5 million views on Facebook and it'll tank on TikTok. Different language, different language, different way of talking, different audience. You need to intuit what the language is. So when, pick a platform, start with, don't do it with everything, pick a platform, and then you're going to figure out the language of your specialty. So if people are talking about trauma, that's my thing. I'll use that in this example. People talking about trauma, what topics in trauma are people interested in? How do people talk about it? And how do people respond to different ways of phrasing and talking about trauma? The, the reality is that if you go into is like a, a holistic guide on your vagal nerve, no one's going to click on that. Like, why would, who cares about a vagal? What's a vagal nerve? Like, like people are not going to know what you're talking about. Um, if you go in even with like five steps to cure your anxiety, on some platforms, that's going to work. On some platforms, that's not. Like, you need to know the language of your platform. Okay, so watch it. Study. Take a few months. And again, we're talking like 30 minutes a day, an hour a day. Like, just just uh, put it into your calendar that I'm just going to read. I'm just going to see what's up. And I'm going to go all the way through. And what I like to do is look and see how content has changed over time, too. So um, what topics are focused on most? Uh, which of their posts go viral? And which of their posts don't do well? I love looking at that, right? That'll really tell you. Even the people who have, you know, the pulse on what's going on, you know, like we said, the democratization of video views, people can have millions of followers and one video will have 4,000 views. One video will have millions of views. And even on the best of the best, they'll, you'll, you'll see huge variation. So why? Which of their posts go viral? Which of them posts don't do well? And why? Are there common patterns? And I'm not talking about stealing their ideas. I'm not talking about plagiarism. I'm talking about technique. I'm talking about writing style. Here's what I mean. So like, let's look at Nicole's. This is Nicola Perez. Um, I just took three of her really well done posts. Like they all have over 200,000 likes. Um, what patterns do you see? Look at all three, read through them for a second and go into the chat. Tell me what you notice. I'm going to read it out loud. What do you notice? Short, sweet, to the point. Yep. Consistency. Yep. 
font size. Yes. Arrows. Good. Yep. No clinical jargon. A plus. How to. Yes. Relatable. Casual language. Bingo. Fact. Solution. Brilliant. Engaging fact. By the way, this is what we do in the group consultations, by the way. When we hop on these meetings, this is what we're talking about. We're talking about ways to position and repackage a great idea you have, your unique voice, in the way that it will be received. And what's great is that you'll have hundreds of minds, hundreds of therapists all thinking about your post together and fine-tuning it so that you can um, have the best approach possible. Focus content. Visual, simple. Colors. Yes, clarity, easy to read. Here's what I noticed. You know what I noticed? Oh, got ahead of myself. We're going to Julie next. Um, here's what I noticed. Uh, she has her thesis in the first statement. You, you're reading that first sentence and you know exactly what this post is going to be about. Here's, here's a huge mistake I see from people who are starting out. They're like, let me tell you an analogy of a man who once walked across a bridge and he and he and he looked across the bridge and he fished and he when he fished he pulled up a coin and the coin said this is just like you know when we da 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 like what are you talking about no one no one, I don't care scroll I don't know who you are right because in democratization of the video views I I'm not when I look in my feed I'm not finding people I follow who I already have a rapport with I'm looking at individual pieces of content the algorithm thinks I'll be interested in so. Most people, when they're looking at content, they're not looking even at who wrote it. They're not looking at, oh, do I trust this person? Is this person someone I like? They're just looking at, oh, is this piece of content interesting? So if you're starting out with some big, boring analogy, scroll. Like, look at this. This is brilliant. The black sheep is labeled the most difficult person in the family. I know exactly what this post is going to be about. And look, some of these posts, if you see the little dots at the bottom, eight, nine, ten roles in this carousel. So she's given like a full blog in this thing, and they do great. But that's because you hooked right at the beginning. This is called the hook. That first sentence is called the hook. Relationships end because they don't talk. Boom. Her hooks, seven words max. Right? Seven words max. You know the topic. You know exactly what we're in for. You know what we're going to be, if this is relevant to me. And notice they're not like hooky in the sense of like, um, they're not attention grabbers. They're not uh, shocking. They're not uh, sensational. They're not like, I'll show you how to heal trauma. It's not, um, everyone gets this one thing wrong. That, that was old marketing. Like if, if that's where your head goes, that's like influencer marketing. That's 2015 marketing. Current day marketing is relationships end because people don't talk. I'm going to tell you exactly what we're in for. And then I'm going to qualify my statement with the rest of the post. Yes, I love this. Vicky said, these statements... Um, statements of the obvious. Therapists, what's obvious to you is not obvious to people. That's why they're coming and paying you $150 an hour to talk to you for an hour because they need what you know. That's how valuable your insights are. They'll come, take an hour out of their day, drive to your office that smells weird, and they'll sit there super awkward and listen to what you have to say. They'll go through all that discomfort because they need to know what you have to say right? If, if something is obvious to you, it's probably not obvious to other people. You're not writing this for you. You're not writing a page full of insights you think are deep. You're writing stuff that people need, like a cup of cold water on a hot day. Someone's like, the black sheep is labeled the most difficult person in the family. Oh my gosh, I feel like that's me. They're usually the most sensitive, honest, and aware. Yes, I've been called oversensitive. I feel like I'm trying to be honest why the black sheep is meant to thrive what meant to thrive and then they'll go in um here's what i've seen nicole do this these i call it the bottom hook um the last statement here is just as important as the first the last statement is to get you to scroll the last statement is like oh i'm going to keep reading so you have to have um you have to have a, a bottom hook that is really interesting she always hangs out on why or how you should write that down that's some of the best advice you're going to get today. Your bottom hook should be here's why or here's how. That's what gets people to scroll on. I've tried so many different things, people. I've tried dozens and dozens of different bottom hooks. Nothing performs better than here's how, here's why. Because it's practical, because it's concrete, because it's actionable. 
People aren't here to hear your philosophy. If you write a post and it's like, here's the difference between um, DBT and somatic experiencing. No one cares. No one cares. A therapist might care. I mean, I would care. I would read it. That sounds great. Um, the everyday person doesn't know what the heck a somatic experiencing is. Okay. All right. Enough of that. Uh, Julie, just look at just look at one scene from her video. What do you notice? She does all videos. What do you notice? Props. Props. Props, props, props. Prop, prop, props. Yep. Fun, playful, colorful. She's like the therapist you wish you had as a kid. I, I heard that explained in an article. There was like Business Insider did a did an article on a few of us, uh, Michelin, me, uh, Julie, uh, she, and they wrote these little bios about what, what we're like, which was entertaining to read. Um, Julie, they were like, oh yeah, she's like that kid. She's like the therapist you wish you had as a kid. Like if you were 13, if you were 12, wouldn't that be a blast to go see this lady? You take one look at her and be like, oh, this is going to be awesome, right? Doesn't a part of you almost get a bit emotional? You're like, yeah, she's sweet. She seems kind. She has a British accent, which means she's probably super smart, right? She has these props. Props, props, props. It's visual. It's so visual. She just camps out on visual. And I think there's so much wisdom to that. And when you watch her videos, they very are like stating the obvious. Um, no therapist is going to be blown away by what she's making. And that's not an insult to Julie. That's not who she's writing it for. She's writing it for a kid. She's writing it for a 13-year-old, 14-year-old. She's talking about what depersonalization is. And she uses a giant time thing, whatever that's called. Yeah. It's relatable. It's warm. It's colorful. Yeah. And she's, uh, she's so, so sweet as a person. I've gotten to talk to her on the phone a few times. We've been on some calls. She's been on my podcast. Um, she's the real deal. She's blowing up in the UK, by the way. Just, I think, like the most purchased self-help book in the history of the UK, her book that she just came out with. So if you're not following her, paying attention to her work, she's she's someone that you should be paying attention to. She's great. Try on approaches like you're trying on clothes. Um, uh, her account is Dr. Julie. I saw that in the account, by the way. Dr. Julie. Um, yeah, on Instagram, uh, try on, try on approaches. Like you try on clothes. Um, uh, the reality is like, you're going to try a bunch of different things. If you're trying to find your personal aesthetic, if you're trying to find your personal style, I know a lot of artists in the room are going to resist this, but all style is, is combining different things. That's what fashion is. Fashion is uniquely, um, combining things that have already been made and already been done. And if you don't know what it's like um, to uh, try on these clothes, then you're not going to be able to play with it. I think like, you know, something that made Mozart or Bach really great too, is that they, they learned the techniques from their masters. They were super, super dedicated to not just being able to replicate things that have been done before, but to do it better than the person that was done before. And so their art was a combination of mastery of several different things. And you need to think about it like that. You need to think about it like you're trying on clothes. Try props. I mean, try like copying Nicole's structure. And she she would totally say that that's fine too. I actually think she's here um, on the call. Julie and Nicole, I think, are popping in at some point today. They might show up in the chat at some point. But I'm, I'm telling you, Nicole, I'm, I'm sure that if she, was, if she is here, she'll, she might jump in. But like, she would say, copy us. Like, She's she's down because we're learning how to get the mission is to get the information out there. The mission isn't isn't like be the best or be at the top. The mission is get what, whatever works, whatever works to get the message of what can help people with their ADHD or their trauma or their relationships. That's the mission. That's why we're all here. That's like that's why there's not a lot of gatekeeping. It's because it's we're not on mission to get Matthias Barker to be the next Dr. Phil. God forbid. Um, we're on the mission to get the information out there. And so we're sharing everything, you know, we're, and we're fine. If you copy, don't plagiarize, but sh shoot, copy the structure. You, you can look at my page, do what I'm doing. Like try it out. My goodness. There's been so many dudes who build my set and it exactly like I, I'll see them on TikTok, and it'll be the same lamp. 
<laughs> you know, like the same table. And I look at it, it's doing great. And look at 5 million views and I'm a little jealous, but that's fine. Like it's working, you know, that's the point. The point is that it works. And then I comment on it because I want them to feel a little guilty about it, but they should, they should try it out. Um, one guy I really love that it's called the art of healing by Trevor. Go check that out. The art of healing by Trevor. He's on Instagram and on TikTok. He's doing great. Um, he's an example of a guy who kind of took that warm, like our aesthetics are almost exactly the same. And I'm not saying he copied me. I'm not trying to roast him right here. I'm just saying like, it's good. If that's the vibe that's working for some people, people need warm, modern kind of whatever, whatever I am. Um, but we need more versions of that. If that's what's helping people for, and if that's what fits him, like for him, that really fits his whole aesthetic too. Like we're really, really similar. And, uh, I think that's great. With Nicole, you're going to see tons of people, same exact font, same color scheme. That's great. Like, please, please, please use this. Like you're trying on clothes. Okay. Number two, I've, I've talked a lot about that. Number two, um, comment frequently and send personal messages to people you respect. When I had no followers, um, when I had no engagement, what I would do is I would follow therapists. I felt aligned with, I would comment on their things. And then, um, I would send them a personal message and just say, Hey, I really love what you're doing. I think you're doing really good work. I love this about your work. I love when you said this, I think you're doing great. I just wanted you to know, I just think you're doing a killer job. And, uh, I would spend about 30 minutes a day and I could probably get off about 25 messages, 25, 30 messages to people. And I do that every day for months. And, uh, that built incredible rapport with people and a lot of the therapists out there. And here's what happened is that a few of those people blew up and a few of those people are bigger than I am. And we have a really great relationship and we collaborate because I've been engaged with their content since they were at 400 followers, you know? And so that, that's, that's, that's part of this community thing. Like we're all here to help the message get out together. So send comment and comment. Uh, people see when you're engaged, even big profiles, even big people like that are we're paying attention to who's commenting frequently. You know who comments the most on my posts? Her, Elaine, third place therapy. She's doing an amazing job. I want everyone to go follow her immediately because she's just been working hard, posting daily. And she comments on everything that I do. And it kind of makes me super happy. And it, oh, there you are, Elaine. Hi, you're in the chat. It's, it, it's really sweet. And I think you're doing great, Elaine. I think you're doing an amazing job. And I think you should be celebrated for that. And I've really appreciated it when you've commented on my post and you talk about everything you know that you liked about what I'm doing it's meant a lot to me and who knows if if you're watching on here you might you know as you're commenting to people you might show up in someone's random ethics pezzy webinar so hey how about that um okay so number three uh watch tutorials on canva video editing web development do not buy a camera here's here's this the thing that's going to make people a little bit um I don't know a little bit nervous uh, because this is the part that feels like it's a lot of work. Um, here's the reality. You're, you got to pay for these services anyway. So if you're going to have someone else edit your video, you're probably looking at 150 bucks a video. If you're going to have someone give you a full graphic design overhaul, you're looking between 200 and a thousand for, for someone cheap. And me, I pay probably 18 grand for my graphic designer, um, to give me like a full concept on something. It's, 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 it's expensive, you know? So, and then web development ads, if you hire an agency to do your Facebook ads, to do your web development, they're probably going to take 40% of the profit of your product. So the benefit is if you can learn how to do this yourself, you're going to save so much money. I would just say, pick one, start with one. Don't feel like, oh crap, I have to learn all these different things. Just learn one of them because you're going to save money. The more that you can do yourself, especially at the beginning, the faster you're going to be able to scale, the less you're going to be dependent on other people. And these are the things that I've noticed as I've been growing my account that really came in handy. Like, um, and here's, here's, if you're starting out, here's the priority, learn how to use Canva. Um, learn how to learn how to use your phone. Like I was saying earlier, use your phone inside the app. Don't worry about premiere pro. Don't worry about logic. Don't worry about, you know, all those things Just start with canva.com. Look some, look at some tutorials on canva.com or on YouTube about how to build those little tiles. Those are the written things. And then maybe learn Kajabi. Like that's a great uh, website builder. That's where you can like host a class. You can uh, you can sell like a little ebook. You can um, host an email list. You know. So the reality is like these are the things on the technical side of stuff that really feel like they kind of stop people. But if you can develop some of these competencies, 
it's really going to be cheaper in the long run. You're going to be able to scale faster. It's not going to feel as much of a burden. This is like where it starts to feel overwhelming. <laughs> so just here, here's another thing in the consultation groups, we can walk through this stuff too. And you can ask questions. What's cool about that group in the Facebook page is you can be like, Hey, here's my Canva design. How do you add a graphic again? Or, Hey, I'm premiere pro. Like, how do you get the subtitles like that? And people can actually like, we're all trying to do this together. We'll share each other's secrets. I've even had lots of therapists, like I'll hop on calls with them and like walk them through, we'll screen share together on zoom. And like, we'll walk through like how to do it together. So if you need like a supporting community, MatthiasJBarker.com slash groups. So that's, that's what I got. Number four, decide your posting frequency and time for posting. All right. You ready for the secret? Um, posting frequency once a week. If you post once a week, you're going to lose followers. I don't think you can grow an account posting once a week with the exception of podcasts and YouTube. I think you could post a YouTube video once a week and it'd be fine. Podcast once a week, you're fine. Three times a week, you're going to maintain followers. You probably won't grow. Um, that's fine though. If you're just kind of like doing some R and R, you're kind of practicing, you're seeing what works, seeing what's not. If you're kind of ramping up, it's fine. Once a day, you're going to gain followers. I just, that's. I've seen it across almost every, not just therapy, TikTok, um, or, you know, Instagram. Uh, and this is, this is posts, by the way. So if you're, we're talking about post to your feed on TikTok or on Instagram, uh, once a day is the recommendation. Um, and posting frequency. Here's the thing. If you're, if you're here, like you have 30,000 followers at 20,000 followers, and you feel like a plateau, you've been posting every day and it's not working. I would bump it up to two to four times a day, but you're going to need to hire some writers to help. Like, I have a team of two writers that have read everything I've ever made and I've trained them and, and took me about six months. They've read probably like 40 books that I've really been moved by. I've brought them into consulting sessions. Um, I've showed them sessions with me and Frank and David. Like I pretty much tried to train them to think and be kind of like me. One of them is a PhD student getting his doctorate and getting a PsyD. Um, another one has ambitions of being a counselor one day, but um, she's, she's incredible too. So what I've, what I've done is when you kind of get at the point where you're in the middle, and this isn't relevant advice to everybody, when you're in the middle, you're like at 50,000, hundred thousand, and you kind of want to start bumping up past once a day. I think typically you need help to keep that consistent. And we could talk more about that, especially in the consultation group, um, about how to kind of build that, but that's not people writing as if they're you, that's people taking older content. They've already made, they've already read your talks, your, your podcasts, your lectures, and they're finding short pieces of content that they can write out. Like for me, it's, I've been doing videos for three years and I'm just now starting to kind of get into written content. So they're going back into my old videos and they're transcripting it and turning it into a written post. And then making sure there's a good front hook. There's a good bottom hook. Um, it flows well. They're helping me with the captions. I go through, I adjust every single one of them, make sure that they're all in my voice, what I would say. And then we post it that way. And that dramatically like kind of escalates uh, the amount of content that you're able to keep up. If you're here and you're comparing yourself to people who are posting two, three times a day and you're not able to keep up because you're working full time, right? Like you have 25 clients and you're like, how in the world are people posting twice, four times a day? They have teams. They have people helping them. I don't know if anyone let you know that. Like that's, that's what you have to do. And so that's not what you do starting out, but that is what you do kind of midway through. So you should keep that on the horizon. Um, we can talk more about that in, in time. Yeah. Yeah. Someone in the chat said teams are there software scheduling posts. Yep. I have a whole notion, um, system for me and my writing team doing written posts together. Um, a whole posting system. I could talk more about that, but that's kind of in the niche, you know, thing It's not relevant to everybody. Uh, my optimal times for posting 10 AM, 8 PM. That's my, that's when I post That's central, uh, for everyone it's different. I'm not entirely convinced that the time you post is super, super important. To be totally honest with you. I see people post at 5 a.m. and they do great. People post at 11 p.m. does awesome. I think maybe 20%, you know, on one end or the other. I don't think it matters very much. Number five, don't focus on aesthetic consistency. Create variety. Uh, we talked about this a little bit. Try on clothes. Um, try a bunch of different stuff. Do something on ADD. Do something on trauma. Do something on motivation. Do something on uh, personality disorders. Do something on narcissism. Like spread wide at the beginning and then they will let you know what you're good at talking about and then specialize in that that's that's what i did that's not what everyone does but that's what i do um number six respond to every comment and respond to personal messages um this one's going to feel like a lot for some people 
This is not my recommendation of you have to. This is a bonus. This is if you've done the other things and you're looking for something else that could work. It's at this point, some of you might be starting to feel a bit overwhelmed. Like, oh my gosh, this is a lot of work. Please let me re reiterate. Pick two, two of these suggestions out of 10 and just start there, all right? This is a, a marathon, not a sprint. And you, this, this is all centered around the message that could help people being spread out to as many people as possible. That's why I'm being technical. That's why I'm raising the bar here and giving you all these different things that can be done. It's not because you have to, and you're lazy if you don't, and you're not going to succeed if you don't, or it's not to manipulate people. It's not to like be super sharky about like, here's how to just get as famous as possible. It's like, it's the mission. It's the message, right? We're getting the message out. And the thing that gets the message out is people trusting you. People trust you if they have some access to you. At the beginning, respond to every single comment. I did this for a long time. And then it just got to the point where I couldn't keep up because I get tens of thousands of comments on some things sometimes. So yeah, respond to every single comment. Um, and here's uh, the reality. Like with messages, I let people personal message me on Instagram. I don't let them do it on TikTok. Um, but that's because I have someone monitoring my personal messages. And so two options here. One is you can shut down personal messages. I think that's fine. But I don't think that's going to like dramatically hurt your ability to grow anything. Um, on an ethics side, we'll talk about this a little bit later about what to do. Like when someone sends you a suicide note or someone sends you like um, something that would trigger your mandatory report, we're going to talk about that. I'll just tell you, that's only happened to me twice. I have, like I said, millions of followers, done this for three years. It's only happened to me two times. Um, so maybe that'd be different if your content was on depression. Well, my content's on trauma. Like it's pretty similar. Anyway, it doesn't happen often. Something super simple to do when you do run into that. It's not a huge hassle. Um, I'll, I'll explain that later. And uh, yeah, I have my assistant. Um, part of her job is that she uh, goes through my personal messages and, and monitors all of them. So there, if there is something like that, that that can be responded to. And I have like essentially like a list of canned responses because majority of people are like, oh, where's that video that you made on relationships? Or, oh, where's that video you said on apologies? It's usually questions like that. And so that could be totally handled by an assistant. We can talk more about assistance and hiring a personal assistant and the use of that if you want to, but you're going to be doing this on your own to start. And I'll just tell you, like, even at millions of followers, I mean, on Instagram, I get maybe a couple dozen messages a day. It's not super, it's not a huge time constraint. When you're starting out, you, you may go weeks without getting a personal message. Like, so if you're feeling like, oh, that's going to be a lot of work, it's going to be a lot to keep up on. Probably not. And then if you do get to the point where it's a lot to keep up on, you'll probably be in an economic point where you can hire an assistant. So don't, don't get worried about that. Respond to every comment though. That's going to really kind of build a lot of trust and a lot of buy-in. It's so much easier to keep someone that's engaged with your content than to go find someone new to engage with your content. The way you keep them is they feel like you care. You're not just trying to find the most efficient, lazy way to go about this. You actually care about them. That's why you're here because you have a mission. You have a mission for someone. Um, to actually heal or actually be helped by the thing that you're saying, right? So step up. All right, respond. Uh, comment frequency. Here's just a loose list. Um, if you never comment, if you never respond to comments, I think your engagement goes down. If you respond to three comments, you maintain engagement. If you respond to every comment, I think engagement goes up. And that's like your likes, your views, right? Um, I think people check into your account more because they get a notification that you responded to the comment and then they're stoked and then they read more of your videos. So it's a lot of people don't focus on that. Um, when I was talking to Nicole, holistic psychologist, that was one of her first recommendations that she gives people is comment, comment, comment. She'll respond to, even though she has, yeah, like three times as many followers as I do, she'll respond to dozens of comments every day. So it is a priority. Okay, common ideas. If you don't know what to say, like, oh my gosh, what do I say to all these people? Just express gratitude. Thank you. Oh, thanks for saying that. Oh, that's amazing. I'm so glad you're here. And you can be repetitive. Um, for me, I, I, I give a different version of a thank you for like 10 comments. Um, yeah, that's all people want. They just want to see that like, oh, you saw, that's really cool. So, uh, number seven, respond to like-minded colleagues through stitches, duets, and reposts. Okay. So if you don't know what, um, you know, uh, duets and stitches and reposts are, let me just kind of catch people up for folks who don't know. Um, a duet is a social media function, particularly on TikTok, where a user's video 
um, is played and recorded side by side with another user's video, often, you know, for reactions or collaboration. So you can find that on TikTok through these like three dots right here. You click on those three dots and then you can uh, find the duet, the stitch, right? Right there. And so when you click on that duet stitch, you can watch a video and then you can respond to it. Now, this is fun. It's also terrifying. Julie Gottman responded to one of mine last week. I was terrified. I saw it. I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> what did I say? What did I do wrong? And I was like petrified, but she was really sweet. She was just awesome. And she uh, she was really generous and, and, and responded to my video, said I did a good job, which felt really cool to get the master herself to put a, you know, a thumbs up. And then she was like, and he misunderstood this part. And she corrected something that I said, which I was so grateful for. And a lot of people might be a little bit nervous about that. Like, oh, I don't know if I want to turn on stitches. You have the ability to let people stitch your videos or not. Again, even if people are critical, that's okay. The message getting out is the priority. That's the only game in town. The only game we're playing in content creator therapist world is that the message that's going to help people gets out to the world and gets to people who need it. And if that means you got to get humbled by your hero, do it. Like, worth it. So, uh, yeah, I, I keep them on. Anyone can respond. Some people disagree. That's fine. It stirs up conversation. I'll jump in the chat and talk to people. I'm not debating people. I'm not getting in arguments, but I'll respond if it's if it's um something that would be good. And uh, I think that's a great way to engage with people and to respond to folks. It's it's collaborative, right? Okay, number eight, submit requests to podcast as a guest. You can do this. Not everyone knows that you can do this. Um, you can find your favorite podcast and in their website, you can actually go on and then you can usually fill out a form that says like, hey, I, I would like to be a guest. And you give a little bio about who you are. And then um, you say, I'd like to be a guest on your podcast. You can also send an Instagram DM to people um, and just let them know like, hey, I love your podcast. I think you're doing great. Um, I would love to be a guest. Here's kind of my specialty. Here's what I do. Uh, many popular podcasts have request forms that you can fill out, apply to be on. You can also personally message people, right? This isn't rude or presumptuous, right? Some people are like, oh, that feels awkward. That feels like ASCII. That's not the culture. I can just let you know. It's totally normal. It's like totally kosher. You can do that. It's a great way to get some more people to see your work especially when you're starting out to get your name out there. You can request to be on podcasts. Please do it. Yeah, someone in the chat just said, I love when people reach out to be a guest on my podcast. Absolutely. Please do that. Um, and then here's a pro tip. Uh, do research on them and include them in the conversation. Asking the interviewer their opinions on things. You're going to get in these podcasts. They're going to ask you about your specialty, ADD, you know, trauma, whatever. And then you're going to be talking, talking, talking. If you're great, if you're good at this, you're going to ask them questions too. And you're going to have an understanding about who they are because people brought you on to talk about that topic because they care about it too. Obviously they're going through all the time to make this podcast and to edit it and to put it out to people. They care, right? So ask them, they have opinions and I'll tell you, you'll get invited back more. You'll get invited back on podcasts over and over again. If you're actually, you know, a person and <laughs> you have a real conversation, like you're a human being. Um, after you're done, ask, do you know of anyone else that, you know, would enjoy having me on their podcast? Would you introduce me? Yeah, you know, you'll, you'll have a higher likelihood of getting on bigger podcasts. If you have an introduction from someone that person trusts. And again, this is kosher. This is totally normal. This is a fine thing to do. This isn't again, being too ASCII or salesy. This is normal. So, um, yeah, introduce, uh, would you introduce me? I've done that several times. I've had people do that to me and I've introduced them to people. That's great. All right. Number nine. Build a free PDF, quizzes, ebooks in exchange for email signups. Um, email signups, this is a big one. This is another point where people are gonna be like, oh, that feels like a lot of work. It feels technical, that feels hard. So I wanna let you off the hook. You don't have to do this as you're starting out. This can be something you stack on later. That's totally fine. Here's the reality. We live because of the democratization of video viewership. We live in a world where it's really hard to get a hold of people to let them know about the products that you're making. Again, you need to have an economic objective here. You should have a product of some sort. That's what's going to allow you to scale, to get an assistant, to have people looking over your you know, personal messages so that you can do this ethically, so that you can have a day off, so that you can enjoy your weekend and you're not stressing about what to post, so you can be with your kids, so that you can, I don't know, go part-time with your clients and write your book. You should have an economic aspect to this. And the way you do that is by building an email list. Now, I know that there's some people here that are like, who cares about email? That's the thing in the past. 
it's the only place left that's chronological on the internet. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit later. Let me show you something that I would do. PDF. Um, th this is all free, by the way. For Valentine's Day, I made something called the Date Booster. And it's something that you can bring on your Valentine's Day date that's meant to stir up meaningful conversation as you're on your Valentine's Day date. Uh, you just go in, click, you put in your email, they'll send you, um, you know, I'll send you that free date booster and uh, you agree to, to allow me to market to your email and I can send you stuff about courses I'm doing or something like that. Here's what I made. Um, the date booster. So three questions on the card and it just points people to the Gottman Card Dex app. That's all I did. I sent them an email, the Gottman Institute, asked if that was okay with them. They said, well, sure, we'll take your free marketing. Why not? And they seemed pretty happy about that. So the first activity, 10 minutes, you're going to use this portion of the Gottman app. So it's just like meaningful questions that I didn't even have to write these questions. I'm just pointing people to a free resource that's already out there, you know, and then uh, another one and another one, three cards. You can print them off and they're designed. I just made this in Canva in like 10 seconds. And yeah, so where did I find this? I made it in Canva. Um, it's, it's, they have like templates. I think this was a template. I think this was supposed to be like a, uh, invitation to a baby shower. <laughs> like that's where it's a, if it's a, and I just put down bonus activity. I just, yeah, I just put it over top. So it's some baby shower thing, whatever. Um, 30,000 people got that. And this is before I went super viral, by the way, 30,000 people signed up for that thing. And then I made a couple's workshop. And I had 30,000 people I could send an email to about my couple's workshop that I didn't have before. Pretty cool, right? All right. So your email list is the chronological place on the internet. So here's just a little bit perspective. Um, I have 2.7 million TikTok followers, right? I have like 400 something thousand on Instagram, uh, 100,000 something on Facebook. So my average views, I'll get about 300,000 views. That means I reach 8.1% of my audience. My email list has a 40% open rate. Is that hitting you yet? Build your email list. You can build your email list on things like uh, MailChimp. That's, that's a common service. Or Kajabi, like I recommended earlier. There's lots of different ones. You can just Google. You can Google like email list builder. And that will allow you to have a link where people can sign up for marketing. You can send an email, sends it out to the masses. So open rates. Um, you have so much more ability to get in front of people if they're on your email list. You don't, and this is, um, well, okay. Oh, there's a repeat here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, one more thing I'll say on this point is, um, I, I don't really believe that the philosophy is like you build a large social media following so that then you can advertise your book. I think what you do is you build a large Instagram following or TikTok following, you move them to your email list with free items, and then you advertise to your email list and you tell your email list about your book. That's the order. A lot of people are like, oh, well, how do I make ads on social media that sell books? And I'm like, I don't think that's the process. The process, social media content to free item, free item, uh, which is your email list, right? Then goes to your product. That's, that's what I do. Okay, so number nine. Number 10, make a web page for people to contact you regarding your main thing. Okay. So if your goal is speaking, they won't know you speak unless you tell them and you have a form on your website. If your goal is brand deals, they won't know unless you have a form. If your goal is coaching, consulting, make a form. This sounds silly. This sounds so obvious, but people don't do it. They're like, oh, I don't get asked to speak in, at, at conferences. And I'm like, well, show me your conference page. I'm like, what do you mean? It's like, well, you know, that page where you list like reviews and people who say that you're a great speaker and the places that you spoke at, like, where is that? And they're like, oh, I just assumed that people would email me. Well, yeah, they don't know. Um, when people click on the link in bio, it needs to go to your economic goal, right? So a lot of people use Linktree. So here's how I organize my Linktree. You have the free comments. So free content online, that's your TikToks, that's your posts, link in bio, and then it goes to the free PDF quiz or ebook, right? That gets people to your email list or to the form to your main thing. So for me, that's workshops, you know, so you'll see, hey, here's a free thing. And then right under that, you'll see, hey, here's my couples workshop, parenting workshop, whatever. You don't advertise your product by just posting on social media. Um, you give value so that they'll join you, right? If this feels overwhelming. 
you don't have to do it all. <laughs> you don't. You don't have to do it all. All right, let's take a. Let's do this. We have a break coming up. It's ten forty nine. Our break is at eleven. Let's do ten minutes of Q and A, uh, and well, so we're going to switch this up. Let's do Q and A now, and then we'll take our break right at eleven. Does that feel okay? Okay. Um. Okay. Great. I'm going to go into the Q and A tab. If you have questions, put them in the Q and A tab, not in the chat. Do do me a favor there. Did that feel like a lot? Did that feel too overwhelming? A lot there. All right. How often do you post content to spread your mission? Um, every day. Every piece of content I do is about spreading the mission. That's what I mean. It's it's not it's not like I make a piece of content that says, "Hey, everyone, here's my mission." I'm I'm acting out the mission. I'm giving people resources on um, how to heal from trauma, how to heal relationships. Those are my two big ones: how to heal relationships, how to heal trauma. Right. So I have a tagline like moving towards what's meaningful. So a big part of my philosophy, because I did a lot of training and act as well, was moving towards the hard stuff. So that's that's kind of what I mean. I mean, the mission is thematically spread out in all of your content. And that kind of um, one big concern is being negatively slammed online, dealing with people trying to defame or cancel. So many influencers are attacked. Because once you're out there, you're so susceptible to attacks and other types of negative issues and harassment. It's so much risk management. Do you have any suggestions to help prevent this? I, I get very, very little negative pushback because I'm not trying to start fights. I think um, here's a couple of things I've chosen to do for my brand. And I'm not, this isn't a criticism on anyone who does, does it differently. I don't talk about politics. I don't talk about um world events. I don't talk about, um, I rarely talk about my personal philosophies on contentious items. I talk about my mission, which is helping people heal trauma and heal relationships. That's what I talk about. So this isn't, my page isn't Matthias's opinions on everything. It's Matthias's opinions on those two things, how to heal trauma, how to heal relationships. Now, there's lots of people who really incorporate maybe a social justice element into their um, platform like Michelin does that. Michelin's been talking a lot about what's going on in Israel and Palestine. Um, there's uh, folks like Courtney, um, the the Truth Doctor. She's really big on talking about her experience with borderline personality disorder, and uh, she she's someone who really kind of lets people into the personal details of her life. I think that you, when when you give off heat, <laughs> you will get heat back in return. Um, I think like I've talked to Julie similarly and Julie's kind of similar to me. Like we don't really talk about world events and we keep it pretty positive most of the time. We don't get a lot of negative doxing, canceling. Um, there's certainly people who are, uh, who do give negative feedback, but it's, it certainly doesn't turn into like a group movement. I've also kind of avoided Twitter for that reason. I think a lot of the doxing happens on Twitter. <laughs> um, I don't know. Like, and and there's certainly like, people who will who will make it their mission to just make life hard for you. Like, I think Nicole's experienced a lot of that. Um, but I would say just generally my tips for that is just like, pick what you want to talk about. And then if, if what you are passionate about is a topic that is controversial, that's fine and good. I'm not saying like avoid controversial topics, but just, but know that that's kind of the relation. Like you're gonna, you're gonna, uh, I heard a statement that I thought was really good. And it's like the more, um, magnetic pull you have the more magnetic repulsion you have kind of like thinking about a magnet it's like if you have a strong magnetic charge you're going to bring people in you're also going to push people away i think that's okay so i think that genuinely you know like i think um there will be times that there is negative feedback a lot of us have this huge concern of being canceled i don't think that's as much of a problem anymore i i've, I've looked at canceling and i don't think you lose your platform i think you you trim your platform, meaning guys like Jordan Peterson, that dude's doing fine. Like, like he's been canceled at every uh, version of the word you could imagine. Like even by his own psychological association <laughs> by school, like uh, there's not an entity that has the power to cancel that hasn't tried to cancel him. And he still has millions of people engaging with his work and buying his courses and coming to his events. His events are sold out. He still has people, you know? So like, I don't even think that if you 
tried to be as controversial as you possibly could be in ways like Jordan has, um, you would like lose your career or something. Now he has to hire private security, like, you know, but the, the reality is like, I think that there's still a career there. I think we're far away from the days where people kind of announce something problematic about you and then you're done. Like, I just don't think that's how it is anymore. Um, I think the things that protect you from that is having a strong email list. <laughs> like I do for me, it was like, I was like, I, if I had a mass unfollowing on Instagram for something I said that was problematic, um, okay. But I have my, you know, several hundred thousand people on my email list that I can still get a hold of that. Even if Instagram kicked me off or, and I, I don't know why they would, I don't, I don't have anything in that I'm hiding that, that I think will be a big controversy, but just to say like worse comes to worse. Um, I have ways of contacting my people through multiple platforms. Not, I'm, not all my eggs are just in that basket. So if for you, the canceling thing is like a huge deterrent, I'd say some practical advice is um, stay uh, centered on your mission and diversify the ways you can contact people and know that the heat you give out will be the heat you get back. I'm friends with a guy named Lane Norton. He's, um, he's a fitness nutrition guy. He's a PhD. Um, He's always like calling people out and like calling out people on their BS, you know, mental or not, not mental lab, uh, nutrition tips. He has a lot of heat because he's given out a lot of heat, but that's also his personality. So I think if you're really worried about it, you're fine. You'll be all right. I know. Um, I think the, the peeps, the pieces that a lot of people get really nervous about, um, are like how to talk about political stuff, how to talk about faith and religious stuff, how to talk about, um, worried that they're going to say something like theoretically wrong. And then like the academy or like their colleagues are going to come after them. I think a lot of that has a lot more to do with. Uh, this is where I'm going to put my therapist hat back on. I, I'm just, I'm curious about the wounds you've had in the past where you've been exiled for doing it wrong. And I'm curious about how much of that wounding that you have in your heart from not being accepted, from being isolated and kicked out of a group you really wanted to belong to, whether that's your parents or school is becoming a boundary and you getting your voice out to people who need to hear it. I'm here to tell you that's your ego in the way. That's fear. Ego is all fear. It's fear. For me, I started to feel more relaxed when I'm like, it's worth it. If I could get my message out to people and then people find a problem, for example, like I'm Christian, I go to an evangelical church. If people like, zoom up on that and they're super pissed that I'm a part of like an evangelical church. Okay. Worth it. Like I'm, I have a singular mission. And so they can look at my content and see what I'm about. They can give me all sorts of accusations with whatever experience they've had with Christian folks in the past. And they're like, oh, he's probably problematic for this reason or that, whatever. Like that's, that's yours. I am centered on this. And I think the people who know me well know that that's my mission. Um, even people in this, you know, in this workshop, even me doing this thing with Pezzi on ethics, I'm calling out the critics. I'm sure there's going to be people coming over this training and being like, okay, who's this influencer kid who's trying to teach ethics? Like he forgot about this one. He forgot about this one. He's training people to, to be unethical and da, 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 and on TikTok. Like I'm, I'm going to get that, but that's fine. My mission is to help. My mission is to help to get the message out. And if I make mistakes along the way, if I don't draw the line in the right place, Okay, I'm going to learn and I'm going to figure out the right place to draw them. Um, because the question is never doing it right. The question is always the mission. So I know I sound like a broken record, but David says nothing unethical about what you've shared so far. Okay, well, that's nice. Thanks. I hope <laughs> uh, it's okay if there is. I'm learning. I'm not the authority here. Just no one's done anything like this, you know? No one's made anything like this. This was so hard to figure out by myself. Can I just be honest with you? It was kind of terrifying. I was pretty anxious about it because I'm like, I don't want to lose my license. I don't want to ruin the field. I don't want to water down mental health content. I don't want to like tell someone something wrong. There's people listening to me that are really vulnerable and they, they're going through it and they're coming to me for help. And I don't want to say something that would make it worse. Petrified by that, if I'm being honest. That's why I was so um, zealous about getting supervision. I was fully licensed. Like I didn't need hours, but I, I went to Frank. I trust Frank. I went to David. I went to Deanie. It's like, I need you looking over my shoulder. I need you watching these workshops and seeing my posts and telling me when I'm off. And there have been times 
when they've messaged me and be like, this post ain't it, take it down. I do. So like, are you submitted to people that you trust? And I think if people come after me, I, I have voices that are going to stand up and be like, no, Matthias is, is doing a good job. And I'm not saying that out of some sort of pride or like I've, I've done the hard thing and that's submit myself to people I trust. And I think that if you're a cowboy or cowgirl out there, just doing it on your own. Yeah. You're more vulnerable. Um, and I'm also not making promises that I know all the right answers. Okay. That's enough. That's enough for me on that. Um, let's take a break. 11 o'clock made it 11 o'clock. Let's take 15 minutes. And then we'll be back and we're going to dive into the ethics. Make sure to get your CEs. All right. Don't do a big ethics course and not get your CEs. Like if you really want to get to the end of your license, you know, registration, sign up, whatever. And I'm like, oh, I got to go take a ethics course. No, like you or you're sitting here, like just do it. Get your ethics thing. And uh, you can check out the group page too on your break if you want. Check that out. I'm excited about that. Feel free to ask questions about that in the chat. I'll be kind of like hanging out here. Just um getting some water. And um, so if, if you have any questions in the chat about the, the groups, I'm, I'm happy to kind of comment on that during the break if you want to ground. but go to the bathroom, get some water, get a snack. I'll see you in about 15 minutes. Yeah. Thanks everybody.
everyone. I hope you're all able to get up, stretch, maybe go outside, get some fresh air. I don't know where all of you are tuning in from, but I cannot do that as I am up in Wisconsin. So it did not go outside. But for those that can, I hope you did that. Maybe get some food, coffee, whatever you need to be able to sit here and continue to listen to this amazing presentation that Matthias is giving. So much great interaction in the chat and Q&A. I do want to do a couple quick reminders before we get back to Matthias doing his amazing presentation. If you have any general questions regarding CE or the event, please visit the FAQ page in your event portal you use to access this webinar. Trust me, all of the questions that you probably have are there. And if not, customer service is on hand to help you as well. We want to make sure everyone has all of their questions answered, at least the ones that aren't content related. So Matthias doesn't have to worry about them, right? Again, the Q&A future is available. Uh, as well as the chat feature, please try and keep all of your content related questions in the Q&A so that he can interact and react with the chat as it keeps going. Um, we appreciate all the interaction and stuff. I know Matthias loves it. Again, in the chat option and the Q&A option, if you see questions you like or would like specifically asked, please feel free to click a thumbs up on those. There also is a way to segment them to see the most upvoted ones so that you can see those and decide if you want to upvote on those as well, or if you want to upvote some of the other ones. Again, shout out to Matthias for personally reading those and answering them. Not a lot of speakers do that, so it's fantastic to see that throughout today. So quick reminders around CE as well. If you have purchased live CE credit, your live CE certificate will be made available after the event has ended. If you have not purchased CE credit, there is still time to do so. I have been seeing some questions around the recording as well. All registrants, whether you paid for CE or not, will have access to the recording for 14 days after the event. So don't worry. If you missed anything, if you feel like you forgot something, you can always go back and rewatch it. Uh, fantastic resource. And again, massive shout out to Matthias for being here today and doing this all for us. I know I've learned a lot and we haven't even hit lunch yet. So I can only imagine uh, what the rest of the day has in store. So without further ado, uh, Matthias, take it away. You're still muted, Matthias. That was embarrassing. Hello. Hi, everybody. <laughs> All right. Um, let me screen share here. Let's get back over to some slides. Wait. There we go. No one can see that, yeah? Where are my slides going? Ah. Slight, slight technical difficulties. Stand by. Found it. All right, everyone can see that well? Hmm. Okay, I'm gonna be keeping the chat open throughout some pieces of this. I won't be able to answer all questions that come in through the chat. I think um, I'm not going to be able to keep an eye on it the full time. But as I kind of get to the end of different segments, I'll keep an eye out there. But we also have some designated um, spaces for Q and A. Here's <clears throat> how I want to kind of start. How do we do this ethically? Is There's a lot of ground um, to be taken on establishing the official agreed upon protocols for how to handle this. The, the state of things now <clears throat> is we have to intuit and interpret the laws and ethics codes to arrive at our best um, educated, well thought out guess as to how to man maneuver this ethically. So I don't want anyone to misunderstand this course as the official stamp of what you should and shouldn't do. <clears throat> this is a resource for you to be able to build your own plan as you navigate social media <clears throat> that resonates with your values and your interpretation of the ethics. And I think as time goes on, um, different associations will stamp on one side or the other on some of these and we'll adjust course. And so um, know that this is a flexible presentation. I'm going to be giving you um, really a few things. The, the places that I've run up to in building my platform, the things that I've had to really wrestle over, I've paid tens of thousands of dollars in lawyer fees to investigate some of these things. I've been on the phone with the APA, uh, sorry, not APA, ACA, 
um, to try to figure out some of these things. And the ACA is notorious, notoriously vague in putting their foot down on some of these things um, uh, until really there's like a, a more concerted effort from a committee that's been established to, you know, to, to do that. So that's, that's good and fine. That's not criticism of them. It's just underlining that we are kind of in uh, interpretive territory. That's just kind of the nature of the circumstance. So here's where I want to start is I want to start actually by building a value ethics compass. Value ethics compass is my name essentially for how do we navigate the ambiguities? How do we navigate when we don't know what to do? And that's what I want to share with you is something that I think could be really useful in navigating the ambiguities. Here's the problem. The current ethical dilemmas experienced by therapists um, are a lot. <laughs> here's, a, here's a really great uh, just committee that was put together. Uh, a few different universities, like there, there was really a concerted effort in this study. I think it's really, really great. Um, this was uh, doing a wide kind of res you know observation of the research on this. Here's something to kind of zoom in on. Um, there's few qualitative studies interviewing Australian doctors to understand their intentions in using social media. The doctors reported some positive uses, such as the dissemination of health information, community support. Um, they also reported barriers in social media being used more widely by healthcare professionals, such as privacy, blurred professional boundaries. Um, the doctors reported concerns around poor quality health information being shared online by their doctors. Sorry, zooming out a bit. This isn't the committee that did, I mean, that's coming up here in just a minute. This is just underscoring just some of the people that have been coming forward saying, hey, we have a problem here. Um, blurred professional boundaries, poor quality health information is going out. We have a problem. Um, and then moving forward, there, there's a clear gap in the literature and more qualitative studies need to explore ethical dilemmas experienced by other health professionals, particularly mental health professionals. And their conclusion in this article is that there's a great risk of ethical dilemmas experienced online with therapists going on social media. This just underscores what we've been talking about, especially at the beginning. Reports are on the rise. Regulatory boards have increasingly been inundated with complaints of unethical behavior from medical professionals in the domain of social media. And many therapists have reported that while the guidelines have been written in recent years to clarify, they're not very specific. Like I was saying, surveys of mental health professionals report that they have not received adequate education or training on this topic, which may impact their professional conduct. Conduct. So here's my solution. I'm trying to rise to the occasion here and help. Um, I think it'd be really helpful if you had an understanding of various ethical codes. I'm actually going to compare and contrast various ethical codes here um, pertaining to social media use in creating a personal brand as a practitioner or psychoeducator as a content creator, right? And understanding a federal trade commission. Some of you might not know this, but there's actually laws in the US that prohibit certain kinds of marketing strategies when it comes to health products. And that, that does extend to mental health products. Most of us don't really know what the laws are when it comes to selling your online course on depression or anxiety. You should know that. So I did a bunch of research on this to, to try to summarize it for you. Because I think if with this understanding, we're going to be able to do a few things. We're going to develop a personalized value ethic compass. Um, we're going to develop a personalized disclosure form for clients. And you could use this also uh, for prospective clients on your website, if you so wish. Um, we're going to demonstrate the ability to assess sales copy and edit sales copy in agreement with FTC laws. And you're going to practice this um, by some real life ethical dilemmas that I've faced, that many of my colleagues have faced. We're going to apply all this. And I, I created a bunch of vignettes that I think are going to be kind of fun um, with some options of how to respond to it. We're going to, we're going to be discussing that together. It should be a good time. Uh, I'm doing my best to make a gripping and entertaining ethics course. So uh, we'll see if I accomplish that. But I really think this is super important. Um, all sorts of different dilemmas, public presence and confidentiality, using clients' experiences as content inspiration. We really need to talk about that. Uh, participation in online public products, problematic messages from people, um, staying within your competency. Here's what will not be covered today. Facebook friends, searching clients online. We already have talked about that. I think that there's lots of full courses you can take that will tell you, essentially the answer is just don't do it. Don't add your clients as Facebook friends in your personal Facebook account. And 
don't search about them online. There you go. I just gave you a full ethics course in just that. Um, but I'm also not going to be talking about your state or province's laws concerning any of the topics discussed. So like I said, this is a resource for you. This is not the full comprehensive report on everything you need to know. There's no way I could synthesize every state or province in this. So this is not my goal here. Um, let's start with, with this. The Value Ethics Compass is a personalized procedure that allows you to critically compare potential courses of action against um, your professional obligations, your ethics, and your values. So we need to start with the question, which ethics categories are relevant? So this, this is what I was referring to earlier. I got a little out of place. Um, great article here. Reports the methods and results of a task force that was assigned to create guidelines for psychology, regulatory boards in Canada and the U.S. and its territories regarding the use of social media by psychologists to consider and make recommendations in regard to regulatory language. So here's what they reviewed. They looked over all these different medical associations, all the different recommendations for social media use, whole bunch of them, and they synthesized and condensed main ethical categories. So if you're taking notes, this is what you should be thinking about. Confidentiality, informed consent, risk management, multiple relationships, competence, professional conduct, security of information, personal use of social media, and the regulatory board's use of social media. We're going to dive into the specifics of each of these in just a little bit. So I'm going to do kind of a broad overview right now. We're going to dive in specifically into each of those categories in a little bit. Once relevant ethical categories are decided upon in front of mind, we need a system for viewing ethical ambiguities through the lens of our personal values. This is where I think a SWOT analysis could be really helpful. So a SWOT analysis, for those who aren't um, you know, familiar, it's kind of an acronym here, um, strengths. In what ways did this potential action honor or fulfill my values? Weaknesses. In what ways does this potential action strike my conscience? or potentially violate my values. Opportunities. In what way could this potential action expand access to needed resources, do good, or promote flourishing? Threats. In what ways could this potential action threaten the security of confidential information, harm a current or potential client, obfuscate relational boundaries? Here's a really great kind of um, uh, just, I think, breakdown of how these work within values. I like this by Sarsberry. Um, wrote a whole book on SWOT analysis. It's, it's a really great book if you kind of want to dive into this a little deeper, like if you do this with maybe your team or your group of therapists. Um, the strength, this is strengths and weaknesses, that's your internal values. The opportunities and threats, that's like the external consequences, right? So we take essentially um, these strengths and weaknesses and we think, what are the like internal things? Like let's take an inventory of what internally is happening at the prospect of various ways of handling an ethically ambiguous you know, circumstance. And then what are the external features? How could this hurt someone? How could this benefit someone? And that is really my you know, version of the value ethics compass. Step one, we define the ethical dilemma and we list potential responses. Step two, we identify relevant code. So everyone here, probably under a different code. If you want to do this, you can open up another tab in your um, browser and you can pull up your ethics code, whether it's the APA, the ACA. We're going to have a little assignment here in just a minute. And then you're going to perform a SWOT analysis. Step four, you're going to decide upon courses of action and document. And step five, you're going to go through some optional, this is an optional step, but going to go through some feedback. So let's do this. We're actually going to just think about this. And this is going to be fun. We're going to be doing this kind of at the beginning. And at the end, we're going to have some more dilemmas that we're going to go through. It'll be kind of like a nice compare and contrast of how we um, engage with some of these topics um, with kind of the broader view, what you're sitting with right now as you're coming into this workshop. And then after we kind of go through the deep dive, how this is going to influence how you make these decisions at the end. So to kind of um, just get a pulse, let's go ahead and read through just some of these vignettes for a second. Pick one of the two ethical dilemmas below. And use the value ethics compass to reflect on possible responses. All right. So I gave you the first step already. We're going to define the ethical dilemma. Here's, here's two that you can choose from. Number one, you're a podcaster and interview guests on topics of mental health. A guest asks you a question about co-parenting 
An example comes to mind of a past client of yours who's faced a similar situation. You would like to refer to this insight in an ethical manner without compromising your ethical obligations to your client. How would you go about that? We're going to go through the value ethics compass, each of those steps to go through this potential, you know, potential action steps there. Number two, you were offered $50,000 to do a brand partnership with a popular makeup brand to promote to your online audience where you provide psychoeducation. They would like you to share a link to their website where the campaign is positioned, do something loving for yourself. You deserve some self-care. Bye now. Anyone triggered by that? I am. All right, pick one. Go ahead. We're going to take probably not the full 30 minutes, probably going to take 20 minutes. I'll come back on um, with 10 minutes and actually break down how I would kind of move through this too. We're going to have some discussion here, but I want you to take 20 minutes. Here's why you need some time to do this. I need you to pull up your ethics codes and really without any input from me right at the beginning, how will you go through which categories that we just talked about right there, right? And you have this in your notes, by the way, if you're like, oh, well, hold on. What were those like relevant categories? If you go into your manual, I have those listed in your manual. You can go there, go through those relevant categories, reference them within your ethical code and do a little bit of research on how that might inform how you approach this potential circumstance. And then I want you to perform a SWOT analysis and really just jot out. You can just do some bullet points, grab a piece of paper, do a bullet points. I want you to think through what internally is happening when you read this. What's frustrating you? What's making you uncomfortable? I don't know, what seems obvious, what doesn't? And then think through the external. Think through what, uh, how this could affect another person and what the benefit could be to people. And then we'll do some feedback together. So let's do this um, 20, 30 minutes. I'll probably come on in 20 minutes. At um, 11, let's say 50. So that's like 18 minutes. Um, at 11, 50, 11, 51, I'll come back on. And I want you to go through on a piece of paper, jot down these things, and then we're going to go through um, and we're going to do a deep dive into these ethics codes to get a more clear understanding of it. But this would be a great reference point right at the beginning. All right. Enjoy. I'll say this too. I'm going to be in the chat. If you need um, some feedback or if you have questions, Happy to be in the chat and be um, talking to you throughout.
Hi, everybody. All right, go ahead and come on back. Finish up your notes. How'd we do? How'd that feel? Okay. Um, here's here's what I'm trying to figure out as far as the Q and A goes, and kind of diving into that. We have a lot of questions in the chat around social media. I'm tempted to clear them out, and then we'll have questions regarding the ethics portion, and then we'll resume questions about kind of the business strategy stuff once we get to the final section of the day. So. Just so you know, at the end of the day, we're going back into how to make viral videos, but with this being the ethics portion, um, we're going to keep it pretty um, centered on the ethics. All right, hold on. And I'm not sure. I'm not sure how to clear out the Q&A. I wonder if Spencer knows how. Okay, so for the time being, let's use the chat. That sound right? Okay, how do we do? Made sense? Um, close and reopen the Q&A. No, I think I'm. what I'm asking is if maybe Spencer or someone on the tech side could remove the questions. We might have to go one by one. Remove the questions in the Q&A to kind of clear out those topics, and then we'll put fresh questions in regarding the ethics, just so I know um, how to sort through them. That'd be helpful. All right. Well, uh, let's dive into some of these vignettes and see what we think. See, see what we got. All right. Let's start with number one. Um, we, oh, sorry. My mouse is behaving funny. Ah. All right. Let's uh, let's start with the number one. You're a podcaster in an interview guest on topics in mental health. A guest asks you a question about co-parenting. An example comes to mind of a past client of yours who faced a similar situation. You would like to refer to the insight in an ethical manner without compromising your ethical obligations to your client. Okay, I have a way I would handle this. Let's talk through yours. So first, what, uh, what ethics codes are relevant here? What topics? Go ahead and maybe just call them out in the chat. What topics, what ethical categories are relevant to consider in this case? Confidentiality? Certainly. That's the big one. How do we, yeah, informed consent? Yeah. Yeah. Boundaries? Yeah. Minors? That's great. Yeah. Exploitation of a client? Identifying information? Good. Privacy? Yeah. <laughs> Great. So those are the relevant codes. So as you were reading those codes, hmm, there's not um, a line for line instruction what to do in this circumstance, is there? Yeah. What does it mean to obscure an insight sufficiently to protect and to account for each of these things? So as you were doing the SWOT analysis, what came to mind? So just to remind you, SWOT, what are the strengths? Let's start with that. What are the strengths? How does this potentially honor my values? The idea of sharing an insight, sharing a clinical piece of wisdom that you've derived from a session with um, an audience on a podcast. Why would that be a positive thing? Yeah, other people may benefit. Certainly, that's it. Yep, sharing info with the public. <laughs> Connects to the audience. Understandable. Yeah, it helps others. It's generalized. Build rapport. Yep. People connect to personal stories. People connect to experiences. Yeah, it's validating. That's a great one, Linda. It's validating. Normalizes, certainly. Builds trust. Yeah, I think all those things. I think you're certainly right. Weaknesses. What are the potential, um, you know, what strikes your conscience about this? What potentially violates your values? So before we get to like how this can negatively affect the client, all right, in this stage of the SWOT analysis, we're asking like, what hits your conscience? Anything negative here? Exploitation? Certainly. I don't want to use somebody. 
Yeah, the client's sharing in confidence. Yep. Yeah. There's a therapeutic alliance to protect, right? It could be triggering to the client, certainly. Yeah. It could break trust. Yeah. It could violate confidentiality, certainly. Mm -hmm. Future clients might be worried. Yep, certainly. Yeah, your credibility is at stake. Mm -hmm. Yeah, breaking the sacredness of the therapeutic relationship. I think those are all really valid. Okay, opportunities. We named a couple of them. It's similar to the strengths. But what are the opportunities? So notice strengths is about your internal values. This fulfills a personal value of wanting to get this message out. What are the strengths? The external benefits, right? What are the benefits to the general public? We kind of named them. We can intuit it. It's education. It's normalizing. It's helping other people. I think what everyone said. Now, what are the threats to the other person? Yeah. So what, in, in other words, what would breaking confidentiality do to that person? What would um them seeing their circumstance called out in front of a lot of people, what like specifically is the harm that would befall them? Fears, broken trust, right. But what's the result of the broken trust? Why is broken trust a bad thing? <clears throat> Shame, yes. More trauma could be, yep, could certainly be traumatizing. Yeah, betrayal, yes. Yeah, guilt, yeah. They can't move forward, right? They might have to start over with a new therapist. Yeah. Psychological safety, re-victimization. Yeah, harms the therapeutic. And, and again, the question here is, okay, it harms the therapeutic relationship, but what, what's bad about that? What is, why is that not helpful for the person reminds them they're not safe it could regress in therapy certainly dissociation yeah if they're angry enough it could make a report hey yeah yeah that's right yeah we do no harm okay good yeah i think i think you all are really you know attaching on to the utility of this here so last one what are your potential courses of action what did you say? Again, I have a way that I would handle this, but what did you say? What is your potential course of action? Go ahead and write that up in the chat. Hmm. Yeah, so Elizabeth says, like, you might preface it by saying, hey, if, um, if you know, someone had this situation, then I would say this. Make a vague generalization, sure. Yeah, in my experience, yeah. A way I might think about this. Yep. So you're not even referring that it was a client story. You're not even referring that you had a client went through this. You're just saying kind of the the topic, you know, the, the the insight. You're skipping the context is another way to think about that. Yeah. Various options that someone could use. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great solution. So you're not just giving one specific thing. You're giving kind of a, a buffet of different options. One of them is informed. Yeah. Obscuring identifying details. Yeah. Make sure it's your own opinion. That's a good one. So it's not even like the client insider is something to do with the client story. It's just your opinion that's informed in the back of your head by something. Informed consent during intake. Yeah, we're going to get to that. I've noticed with my work with clients over the years. Yeah, so you're generalizing it to more people, not just one. Yeah, everyone's doing a great job. These are all good solutions. Anyone who would say don't do it, anyone who would say full on, full stop, nothing, like not worth it, um, don't bring it up. Anyone there? Yep. Okay. Couple. Yeah. I went there first. Yeah. Yeah. Might not share. Okay. Good. Yeah. I think, um, yeah, I would not use it, says Shelby. Yeah. Elizabeth says get permission and then follow up on a later podcast. Sure. That's a, that's a fine. So you can see that there's actually a lot of different places that people would land on this. Sorry about that. There's a lot of different places people would land. Um, <clears throat> here's what we maybe could all agree on is that like saying, oh yeah, I have this client, Jessica, and she was like, da, 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 da. Like we'd all agree like that's obviously not the right path. <laughs> we would not do that. Even saying, man, I have this really high maintenance client on my Thursdays at four, that da, 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 da. Right? Like, so there's some obvious spaces that we could all just, because we're, you know, we have common sense that we're not going to go there. The real question is like, if I said something like, hey, you know, I had a client once who was really struggling with her husband. The husband had a porn addiction and uh, she really took that as like an affair. 
and, you know, and she'd come to me and she'd say, hey, I really don't know if I want to stay with him because of this. And then I told her, you gotta chill, lady. I'm just joking. I, I don't know. That probably shouldn't be what you'd say. Like, that wouldn't be a very good response. I don't know. Whatever you say in your podcast, if you were to talk, you know, about the specifics of the conversation, is that too far? I didn't say her name. Um, I didn't mention her age. I didn't mention where she lived. Everyone's saying yes, too much info. Stay respectful. Yeah, that's a really key point. I think that's something a lot of people don't zoom up on. It's not just the story. It's your response to the story. Do you notice how I kind of was like, and then I told her blank. And then I said something, you know, confrontational. Is that relevant? All right. So then what if I said something like, you know, I've talked to session. I've been in sessions with clients where folks have struggled with porn addiction. And, you know, something I commonly find is that people object in this kind of way. What I've often found is helpful to get people, you know, to the next stage is blank. All right. How does that strike you? Anyone in the chat? Better? All right. We got some goods. We got some thumbs ups. Some folks think it's not quite general enough. Sounds a little bit better. Hey, okay, that's fine. A lot of thumbs up. Better, better. Okay. So you can see that there's kind of a corporate intuition around this. That's actually something to pay attention to. And that's where like the seek feedback option, I think is really helpful to be able to go to folks, to have a community, whether it's someone privately, whether it's, you know, a consultation group to say, Hey, this is, this is how I approached it. It's usually post hoc that we're usually thinking about these things. Do you think I should have been more vague? Do you think I could have said this? I think that we make these decisions in public with people. Does that make sense? So beyond just like, let me, you know, me and Matthias tell you the right answer. I want the larger lesson to be, <clears throat> we think deeply, we document, and then we get feedback and we make these decisions in the company of people that we trust. Because that way, if there is a report, and can I just tell you, I don't know of anyone who's gotten a report um, in, is, is in my circle of like influencers. I've never had a report. I've never heard from the ACA, or I've never had, you know, a government body reach out to me. Um, I don't know anyone who has, it, you know, so th these aren't super frequent. It's not like there's people, you know, right at your elbow with the clipboard, just waiting for you to say the wrong thing. I, I think it's almost a little unfortunate. Maybe, maybe we should have stricter um, auditors, you know, in this space. But the reality is that if someone did come to me, what I'm hopeful about is that I would be able to say, you know what? Yeah, I, I can see auditor but maybe I, I was a little bit too specific. Here's the documentation that in making this decision that I did on this date. And then here's the clinicians and their license that I consulted with on if I made the right call. And that is a pretty powerful thing to bring in any sort of ethics committee, because I don't know, like, what would you say if you were an auditor? That would feel like, oh, okay, cool. And where would you document? I would just say on your computer, it doesn't have to be like an official note, like there's no notary for at least than I know of for like ethics issues for therapists. Um, you just document on a piece of paper or on a board document, you just put in the date, put in the situation, who you talk to. That's what I do. Um, and <clears throat> I think that's adequate. That's that's what I think would actually be helpful here. The thing that I hope to kind of bring to this conversation is instead of just like, hey, let me Matthias tell you the right call, because I might be right or wrong. Um, let's make these decisions together and then let's document. And I think that's actually what's going to be most safe. Now, let's talk about like the specific um, uh, circumstance with a client. I, um, someone said in the chat, do you still see clients? Yeah, I do. I still see clients uh, two days a week. Yeah. Um, so uh, what about the client? What if they get offended? I talk about it in the intake. And so my method, especially since blowing up on social media was, First thing we talk about in the intake after, you know, disclosures like, hey, you know, I'm a mandatory reporter, you know, here's your no show policy, you know, here's how to pay, whatever. I'll say something like, hey, so all my clients now find me from social media. So everyone is universally positive when, when I tell them they're on social media now. Um, that will happen if, if you kind of grow your brand, you're going to find people who find you because of social media. So they see that as a benefit, not a detractor. That's, that's pretty common. Now, when I was starting off, I had a book of 50 clients that I, I got not because of social media, but just because they were assigned to me because I was a new therapist on. So I had to have this conversation with several of them and just be like, hey, this is kind of something new in my life that took off. I'm doing these things. Can I tell you about how I'm getting inspiration for these things? 
because I would never want you to feel that um, your personal private experiences are like <clears throat> material. I don't think about it that way. I, I don't want, I would never want you to feel like you're being used or being exploited in anything that you're sharing with me. I want you to have complete confidence. And if you ever had questions, please come talk to me because I'm more than open. I won't be defensive, I promise. Like I, I want, my priority is always your health. You're my number one priority above and beyond my professional page. If I take you on as my client, I'm making a commitment to you that I'm going to do no harm. And so I, I really want you to feel this openness from me that we can discuss it. So I'll open with something like that. And then I'll say, all right, so here's, here's kind of my method. After sessions, sometimes there'll be like an aha moment that we both kind of come to. That's really impressive. You know, something like a way to describe boundaries, um, a metaphor that's really helpful to understand what it feels like to be dissociated. Descriptors, you know, adjectives. It's like, ah, oh, this, um, this thing that I'm wrestling with is really, it just feels like I'm underwater. And I'm like, oh, underwater is a great way to describe that. And so what I'll do is I have a little document and I kind of jot just down just some like brief notes around like the metaphor or the word picture or the aha moment. And then I'll kind of keep a check mark. Like sometimes the same aha moment happens five or six times with different clients. You know, it turns out that lots of people describe their relationship as walking on eggshells. Lots of people find that <clears throat> coping with, I don't know, narcissistic codependency in their relationships um, is a process of grief because grief includes acceptance and that maybe they're in a spot where they've been trying to control the outcome with a partner who's been acting really maliciously towards them when in reality the thing that's helpful is that they need to grieve a loss, a loss that's already occurred that they might not be, I don't know, accepting, so whatever it is. And I think that's a helpful insight for a lot of people. So sometimes I write those down and when I see that that aha moment strikes a chord with like six, seven people, I might make a video kind of um, explicating that analogy. Here's what I'll never do. I'll never use your name. I'll never even describe like, oh, I had this client once. He was a guy that da, 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 da. I don't tell stories of clients. Like I, I rarely do. I have maybe three stories that I tell and I've gotten written um, uh, documentation I approached them. I said, this story is just so compelling. It was after my, I'm, I'm done working with them. So, you know, we've already completed our sessions together. I'm no longer the therapist. I say, hey, you know, in my book or in this, I think this is such, you have such an incredible story. Um, we've already processed it. There's already been healing there. Would you mind if I told it? I've only done that, not even three times, twice. I've done that two times and I've gotten written documentation from them that that was okay. And they were happy to let me do that. And even in those moments, never share names, really obscure the details. Um, I draw that line way further back. So I know lots of people. I was on a panel at the networker and we were talking about this and there's, I won't say who else was on the panel, but there, there's a few other people on the panel and they were talking about, oh yeah, well, after a client, I've seen them for a while and they're not on my list anymore. Like I can talk about their story in my book, you know, but just, you know, maybe change the sex and a few different um, characteristics that I feel fine with that. Personally, for me, that's not where I draw the line. I don't feel fine with that. Like, and I'm not saying it's wrong if you do. I, I just, that's where the, we're in the ambiguity here. For me, I'm like, I'm going to get written um, consent to tell a story if, if that's what I feel compelled to do. I think I took that note from Hillary McBride. Hillary McBride is a psychologist. She's in Canada. She's in Vancouver. Um, she did that in her book. It was really cool. When you end the book, she says, every story told has written consent from the client that they feel comfortable sharing it. I thought that was a really cool thing to put in her book. Like, that's really neat. So, but again, there's general, there's general pieces here. And so, and then I check with the client. So this is before they've, they've started service with me. This is before they've told me anything. I've read their intake form. That's about it. So I'm like, do you feel comfortable working with me knowing that's how I use your information? I use your information in a very general sense. I synthesize lots of people's experiences into these common little bits that I think are helpful for people. And I want you to have the choice to work with me knowing that's what I do and the chance to ask questions. That's how I do it. And I've had everyone feel really comfortable about that. I've, I've even had a few people be like, you can use my story, it's fine. You can even use my name. And I'm like, I'm not gonna use your name. And then they'll like, They'll like comment, you know, or something on my page and be like, oh, I love this one. Matthias told me this in session last week. And I'm like, stop, stop. You know, like, <laughs> you know, like hold on. We could talk about that. But um, there's, there's, it's fun. It's like, I think that there's a genuine levity once that's on the table. And I think we're scared to bring that up 
But my universal experience with my clients, is, especially if they found you on social media, is they appreciate it. And they're like, yeah, go help the world. Bring these insights to other people. That's awesome. I trust you. And I've never had a client um, call me up and be like, hey, that video seemed really adjacent to my thing. Was that about me? It's never happened. Um, so that's, that's my experience. But again, that's not the authority. That's just my experience. Any questions about that in the, in the chat? Um, yeah. I mean, you can even uh, throw that in the Q&A too. Yeah, any questions about that? Who would uh, who would approach it in a similar way? Would you, would you agree with me in that space? Would you would you pull back a little bit? Do you feel comfortable with a little bit more? There's no there's no like like I said, there's no official stance that I've seen in the research on this. This this is just where I'm putting it. Yeah. So Lydia says I have two separate Facebook pages, personal and professional. Easiest to maintain boundaries. My personal page is under a different name. Friends and family know it. And uh, to further avoid ethical boundary crossing, my professional page has some information that's accessible to the public and to my clients. And their parents can see if they find it on their own. Yes, that's great. Yep, David says, fully agree. Cool. Yeah, Cynthia is talking about some of the difference between coaching and therapy there. Yeah. Okay, cool. So there's some general agreement there. That feels nice for me too. That's good to get that confirmation <laughs> for a big group. Um, yeah, I I really think about it like it's not the story, it's the aha moment. And then if you do hear, I, I let them know too. It's like if you do hear a story, me talking about a story, it's usually fictional or about someone I know in my life that's not a client. So if I do tell us oh, there's one time I knew a guy that da 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 da. That's not code for like this secret client thing um, ever. That, that's always a personal friend, my poor friends. I, I, am, I obey no such rules for my friends. I'll tell your stories to everybody. Um, I'm being I'm being hyperbolic. I, of course, respect my friends' privacy. But okay. Yeah, making up stories is great. No one's mad about that. Um, okay, cool. I'm, I'm looking through the questions there. Um, let me look in the Q and A questions and move on to the next vignette. How would you handle a client situation? whereby they identify themselves in the comment section of your social media posts. Yeah. Okay. So like I said, that's happened to me. Um, and here's what I do. They actually have the right to do that. They can do that. I'm not going to comment back. Um, I'm not going to affirm or deny anything. So, and I have that conversation explicitly. So I say that at the beginning of service, I say, Hey, you're more than welcome to follow my main page, to comment, to engage, to share. You can even sign up for my courses. That's fine. I'm not going to tell you about my courses as we're going through therapies. I'm not going to let you know, hey, make sure to sign up for my marriage thing, anything like that. Um, I'm not going to, I don't know. And I tell my clients too. And I'm like, honestly, if you want any of my courses, I'll just give them to you for free. Like if you're my client, like whatever, I'm not, I don't, you don't need to purchase to sign up for some program. I'll just let you in, whatever. I'll just give it to you for free. Um, and uh, yeah, so then I tell them you can do that. Just know I'm not going to comment back because I don't, I just think that that would create a lot of attention. And I kind of talk through them with the pros and cons. And just like, if people start to put together, you're one of my clients, that's going to create a lot of attention that I'm a little worried for you about. And I would try to persuade them to not to, to, I mean, they can comment, oh, great insight, but don't comment, hey, oh man, so happy he's my therapist. You know, that, I, I worry for you in that. And every client I've had totally respects that and immediately kind of backpedals and then we're good. If I had a client who continued to do that, then I might have to have a more serious conversation where either I would transfer them and then put them in different care, or I would just say, because, because I want to protect your um, safety, because I want to protect your confidentiality, I might have to block you. Do you want to continue in therapy with me, if that's the case? And I'm just saying, just because the territory of you publicly announcing that you're my client it's just not territory I know how to maneuver um, and protect you. And that's always my first, my very first priority is protecting you. So that honestly is like uncharted territory that I don't feel like exploring. And so just my personal, and I'm saying that's all up front. So my personal conviction is you're more than welcome to engage. If you start announcing you're my client, we're probably going to have to change something because I, and not, not because I'm uncomfortable. I want to protect you. I don't know. Anyone have an opinion on that? A thought on that? 
That's what I would do. Yeah. What are the risks of someone says, what are the risks of sharing of someone sharing that you're your client? Well, we, let's go through the SWAT, you know, like what are the risks of someone sharing that they're my client? Personal values. I mean, nothing violates my conscience with them saying that they're my client and feeling happy they're in, they're in work with me. That's good and fine. Um, risks personally. Um, doesn't strike my conscience. Uh, external risks. That's where it really starts to bother me. So what are the threats? Gosh, well, someone can be like, oh, well, you you know, Matthias, and what does he say about this? And, and and start like, I don't know, if I ever had a stalker and then my stalker tried to get at one of my clients to get to me, that'd be awful. I've never like, and, and I have maybe more of those concerns because of the size of my platform than someone else. But that's the kind of, I never want to have any stories like that. I never want to have stories like, but yeah, this one time, my client, this, and then someone tracked her down and because they wanted to get to me. And I'm not saying there's like a high likelihood that would happen. I just, the, those, when I think about the SWAT, that's, that's a potential threat that comes to mind. And what are the benefits? I don't know if there are a lot of perceived benefits with her announcing that, you know, I'm her therapist. Outside of her just feeling like the personal validation of getting to kind of feel celebrated. I mean, that's good and fine. Nothing wrong with that. But um, yeah, so then when I, when I look at that potential courses of action, I don't know what I do. So in the case that she was like, no, I, I'm going to keep talking about it publicly. Probably go to consult with some people. What should I do on this? Let's get a corporate idea of like, here's the steps I think I'm about taking. I mean, a lot like I'm doing right now. We're just thinking through it. And, um, and then I would make a decision and I'd let her know. And I just, uh, yeah, I, I want to err on the side of her safety always. So that's, that's, um, that's one of the weird parts about being in this space. But again, I think the value ethics compass creates a path of at least I have a starting point. And then if I learn later, there's a better way to handle it. I'm going to do that. So that's, that's how I would do it. Any questions about that? Hmm. Julia points out that there's differences in physical health versus mental health. Like no one would be super weird saying, oh, I see them as a primary care provider or a doctor. Yeah, that's a good point, Julia. Yeah, I don't know the answer to that. <clears throat> yeah. uh, someone asked, how, do you, how and where do we document the ethical process? I think just in a Word doc, in a, in a pages document, and then just have your dates, and then who you talk to. I mean, that's good and fine in my book. Okay, let's move to the second vignette, yeah? Oh, man. All right, so you're offered $50,000 to do a brand partnership with a popular makeup brand to promote your online audience where you provide psychoeducation. They would like you uh, to share a link to their website, um, to the campaigns positioned as do something for yourself. You deserve self-care by now. This happened to me. It's not a, it's not a, um, uh, it wasn't a makeup brand. I'm obscuring that a little bit to protect who it might be. Don't do it. I don't know. That's, that's my conclusion. Uh, it was really hard to say no to $50,000. Who doesn't want $50,000? I, I want a license, you know. <laughs> uh, I want to keep my license. I paid 50 grand to not have my license removed. I don't know if this would like technically get your license removed. It's just, in my my opinion, in such poor taste. Um, here's what puts it in poor taste. Actually, the thing that like is the nail in the coffin for me is do something loving for yourself. You deserve some self-care. I have a personal pet peeve. I hate when people use self-care as a marketing campaign to sell um, specifically like beauty care products or um, vitamins. Um, there's a few, there's a few niches that are trying to like co-op self-care in their branding. And it kind of makes me frustrated if you can't tell. Um, it feels icky. It's like commercialism, gross. I'm fine if you have a mental health product and you're genuinely saying, hey, this is like, come on my mental health retreat. It's a gesture of self-care. Good, like it genuinely is. And maybe like resorts and travel stuff kind of are on this weird line. Like, oh, take take a break, you know, kick back, self-care. Maybe it's more understandable there. I don't know. But yeah, that's what did it for me. Now, is it wrong to accept $50,000 to do a brand partnership? Mm. just generally 
if I had an adjacent brand come to me, I'm trying to think of a brand that is adjacent. Let's say like the Calm app came to me or the Gottman Institute came to me and they want to do an official, they want to do an affiliation. Yes, please. Julie, if you're watching, let's do it. Let's do it, girl. I felt weird saying girl. That felt disrespectful. I don't know why. I'm sorry, Dr. Julie. Um, what was I talking about? It depends on the brand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think that that actually changes the conversation. I have a whole section when we go through the code on brand partnership and accepting money to promote to a professional audience. So we're going to dive into the details of that. That I think actually different ethics codes have different ways of handling that. And so that might actually be something that whether you're a psychologist or a therapist or a marriage and family counselor or a social worker that you take a different approach on, depending on your license. That's my conviction. I'll show you what I mean on that. Um, hmm. I'm reading some of the comments here. Yeah. Well, yeah, disclosure forms. Here's here's the reality is like your your audience is not under the same ethical bounds as your clients. And so you you can't promote a product to your clients. That doesn't mean you can't promote a product to your audience. That's not explicit is what I'm saying. I'm not saying that means you can and you should and you, you go for it. I'm just saying we can't use the argument, hey, you uh, it says in the code that you can't promote a product. You can't promote your personal yada yada to your clients. You can't overlay that with your Instagram or TikTok or YouTube audience because they're not, you're not their, you're not, it's not a patient practitioner relationship. There's not a therapeutic relationship with your audience. And so that's actually what creates a little bit of the gray area here is that you can't. And here's the reality. Like some, some folks here might be like, oh, this is so wrong. Like any therapist do this. I had someone tell me that. I had a professor of mine come to me. He's like, if any therapist took a brand deal, they should have their license revoked immediately. I remember he said that really with a lot of conviction. I was like, ooh, wow. And um, my conviction on that is like, no, I don't think that patient client relationship standards apply to audience creator relationships. And I think it has more to do about the relationship and the brand itself and the terms of that agreement and the way you do the ad, I think. I think you have to be really honest. Like something I really admire about Huberman, for example, so Huberman Lab, he's a professor, he's not a therapist, but um, he says, hey, this podcast is completely separate from my work at Stanford. And none of this, um, these are business affiliations. You know, like you say that explicitly. This is, I'm getting paid to talk about these products. These are products I've vetted and that I align with and that I use. And that I think would be a benefit to people. But this is separate from my work as a professional. And I think that's probably the best template I've seen for people who want to do that. And for folks in the chat who are like, no, like, how could you think about doing that? I mean, I'll, most people with a podcast do it. Brene Brown does it. Like, I mean, it, you have to kind of look at what is the group consensus here? It's not just when we're doing the SWOT analysis, it's not just, oh, is there anything that strikes my conscience that means I don't do it? It's, okay, what is the kind of corporate consensus around this in alignment with my values, right? That's why it's called the values ethics compass. It's values, it's ethics. And we're making this decision together. And so I think that if let's say like the APA or the ACA came out and we're like, nope, brand deals off limits, then that would clarify everything. They're like, oh, okay, cool. We'll, uh, we'll create different economic models that don't do brand partnerships. Fine. But I think that there is a gray area right now, as it stands in 2023, that you can't, um, and I'll, I'll explain myself there. And I think it's in the tact of how you go about it, what partnership it is, how explicit you are, that, and in what space. I think podcasting, um, it, nearly every podcast has some form of ads. So if, if you've ever heard someone that you like on a podcast, they're, they're probably doing ads. Um, yeah, that paid sponsorship for podcasts. That's, that's kind of what I'm talking about. So... Um, yeah, so some folks are saying, hey, the code of ethics says no. Um, I'm going to get to that. I, I brought every single ethics code up in front, and I brought the places in the code side by side where we're going to look at that together. So, um, And that's where I also, at the beginning, where I said, I think depending on your license, there's more or less, um, there's more or less space to be able to make this call. Another way to think about this too, what about your book? Like, are you allowed to promote your book? 
if you write a book, is it unethical to make an ad about your book on your Instagram or on your podcast? Probably not. I don't think, I don't know any of us that would be really mad about that. Um, so are you allowed to only promote your products, not other people's? Don't other people have valuable things? Are you allowed to promote your friend's book? You yeah. know? Okay, so if you're allowed to promote your friend's book, are you, are you allowed to receive payment for that if you're explicit about it? And I, again, I'm not saying I know the right answer. I just, these are the questions that I'm thinking about. So here's what I did is I tried it. I tried like, I did um for like three or four episodes, I, I had a couple sponsors that I vetted that I aligned with. And then I spent a long time talking about how uncomfortable I am with ads and how nervous I am to do this ad and how I don't want anyone to confuse it with my private practice. Um, and how I've used these products since before I got paid to use them. I, I just, it was, if, if you listen to it, it's such an apologetic, cringy pitch that no one bought anything. <laughs> I was so nervous. I'm so like just editing in. So I like, and I consulted with three, um, people that I really respect, uh, and documented, did the whole thing. And I just, and then I felt icky about it. And so I just stopped. Can I just be honest with you? That was, that was my experience. And it was on my podcast. Didn't do it on Instagram. Didn't do it on TikTok. I just tried some podcast ads and I just felt icky. So I stopped. I just didn't want it. Like, yeah, Sarah says some not predatory. I didn't want it to feel predatory. I didn't want feel people feel manipulated. Um, I wanted people to feel fine with it. And I think people get that that's part of what makes a podcast sustainable. Yeah. All right. Well, and, uh, and I make no claim that I made the right choice there. That's just part of my experience in figuring this out. Okay. Um, let's do some Q and a, uh, wait, how are we doing on time? Oh yeah. We got 20 minutes. Nah, we're going to do, we're going to skip Q and a for right now. And then, um, we're going to go into the FTC. Yeah. Someone said in the chat, if it feels icky, then you probably shouldn't do it, in my opinion. Yeah, that's what I felt. So that's why I stopped. I I didn't do it for a long time. I tried like three ads and then I was like, yeah, this feels weird. But again, that's not me saying that people do it wrong. Um, we're going to get to the license and we're going to get to that specifically. So even if you're holding like, whoa, I think Matthias recommended something bad there. Again, I'm not recommending anything. I'm just telling you about some of my personal process and we'll get to it. So uh, FTC laws. I like to title this section, um, laws you need to know to not go to jail. Yeah, well, okay. So in the US, there's some laws that um, actually govern uh, the sale of health products. So um, government agency responsible for protecting consumers from deceptive and unfair business practices, including false or misleading advertising, right? So this is really enforcing that you have to say truthful statements. They cannot be misleading. The big rule. Section five, FTC, prohibits unfair or deceptive acts or practices in or affecting commerce. Section 12, prohibits the dissemination of false advertisements for foods, drugs, devices, services, cosmetics. Okay, here's what this means, is that if, you're, if you've been found to be misleading or deceptive, um, specific cases in oral or written representations, uh, misleading price claims, sales of hazardous uh, or systematically deceptive products. Uh, these are the examples, by the way. Uh, services without uh, adequate disclosures. Failure to disclose information regarding pyramid sales. Uh, use of bait and switch techniques. Failure to perform promised services. And failure to meet warranty and obligations. Mm. Here's, here's what this means. Here's the basics, the, the bare bones of it. Um, tell the whole truth. And do not make claims you do not have evidence for. Substantiate your claims. Be prepared to. The most common way people mess this up is making absolute or sweeping claims, right? Absolute sweeping claims. Let's practice. The following is actual sales copy from a well-known psychology creator. Um, I changed it a lot because I don't want to put them under blast. Um, don't want to get my friends in trouble, but I think they messed up a little bit. Let's um, Let's look. We'll see if this gets me in trouble. Um, evaluate the sales copy. Here's part of the copy. I changed it a little bit to protect anonymity. Um, my program is the only program 
the only approach that teaches you how to set firm boundaries and embody your authority while being empathetic and uh, connected to your partner. You will learn to access self-compassion, self-regulation, and self-confidence. And in turn, you will feel equipped to rewire your trauma responses and help your partner do the same. Mm. Any guarantees here? Any sweeping claims? Anything problematic in this? Oh, okay. Yeah, we see in the chat some big promises. The only approach. Yep, nailed it. Whoever called that out first. All right. So I put um, things in red as I think that violates the FTC laws. Um, yellow is like ambiguous. Maybe I don't know. I would change it just to just to be straight up. Okay. Yeah, it's fun to watch everyone comment. Yeah. Well, hey, you know, the more sweeping it is, the better it converts. Th th that's that's like a challenging part of this because, like you could say, like. Um, here's a reminder. You got to tell the truth. How do we fix this? You can't create bad sales copy. You can't be like my program is one of countless approaches that teaches you how to set firm boundaries, body. I will try to teach you self-compassion, self-regulation, self-confidence. And in turn, maybe you'll feel equipped to rewire your trauma responses and help your partner. But let's be honest, who are we kidding? Probably not. You're going to, how many sales are you going to get out of that? Right. Is that really like what's ethical? It's like you got to just be a terrible salesperson? No. I think there's a middle ground and uh, a way that you won't go to jail. Someone says rewire your trauma responses. Sounds like a claim. I mean, that's so vague. Like, what does rewire mean? I mean, I think every experience you ever have rewires your brain. Any, any folks here who know the neurology trauma? Technically, if you create a synaptic connection, you're rewiring the brain. So like, I could smack you and I'm rewiring your brain. Um, okay, sorry, but I, I'm getting too casual. Let's, let's keep this. This is an ethics talk, everybody. We got to get it together. My program, here's how I change this. My program is unique in that it teaches you how to set firm boundaries and embody your authority while being empathetic and connected to your partner, right? You will learn to access self-compassion, self-regulation, and self-confidence, and in turn, possess the tools to rewire your trauma responses and help your partner do the same. I don't know. What do you all think? This is how I would do it. So there's some ambiguity here, right? And, and that's kind of, I think, what, what you gotta have to do. You have to kind of make some ambiguity. It's unique, right? You will learn is still, is still kind of a yellow light. Can we just acknowledge that? Like, I don't know. Is that a guarantee to say you will or is it pretty normal to be like, oh yeah, in my class, you'll learn this. If you go to harvard.com, if you go to yale.com, they're going to tell you like, hey, if you sign up for our psychology program, you're going to learn CBT. <laughs> I'm not about to come at Harvard. I, sorry. Yeah, you will be taught. That's a good one. Someone in the chat, you will be taught. I would probably change it to you. You will be taught. I think that's great. Anyone else? Would anyone else change anything? The information will offer. Perfect. Perfect. Our goal, I love that language. Our goal is this, yep, opportunity to learn. Yeah, this course teaches, that's a great way. Yeah, I think all those are great edits. I would totally, I would make all those changes. That's really great, everybody. Yep, um, let's do it again. The following is actual sales copy from a counseling center's website. I Googled some random counseling centers in different states around the US just to see if I could find some stuff for this. So if you're on this and you're like, wait, did he? Did he find my counseling practice? How does he know about my? It was just total random chance. It was just a lottery. I literally went to like Wisconsin Counseling Center and picked the first thing on there and read through your copy. And now I'm putting you on blast in my ethics webinar. Okay. Whenever there is anything that interferes with your happiness or prevents you from achieving your goals, we may be able to help. We have therapists who specialize in specific issues such as stress, anxiety, um, relationships, parenting, depression addictions, eating, sleep, trauma, anger, family conflicts, LGBTQ matters, uh, grief, religion, self-esteem, and more. All right, what are the problems? Some said too vague. Really long list. That's not against the law. You can, you can make a long list. You're not going to have the police knocking at your door for making a long list. Okay, the word whatever, it's kind of big. It's not bad, really. Yeah, I agree. 
I mean, I'd, I'd put my check mark on this. You know why? Because the word may, that qualifies everything. You, you can make a bunch of big claims and then say may, it may do all these incredible things, right? Now, it's not great sales copy. This isn't like going to result in a bunch of great sales, I think. Um, it could be rewritten better, but there's a difference between something being bad copy. Copy, by the way, if you're confused by my word wording there, copy just means like this is sales. That's the title for it, copy. It's, it's, it's text meant to sell something, text meant to persuade someone. So yeah, it's jumbled. Um, I mean, I mean, whatever maybe is, is a yellow light, but I, I don't personally maybe see that as a big problem. Maybe someone would. All right, next one. The following is actual sales copy from a Psychology Today page. Did you know your Psychology Today page is sales copy? Oh man, everyone just got a little nervous, I bet. Y'all have to go back and read your Psychology Today page. You might be breaking FTC laws. Yep, I went into Psychology Today and I copy and pasted some of y'all sales copies. I don't know, maybe not you, but I did. I went into some random therapists in Illinois and we're about to see what they did. If you see your own sales copy, buckle up. Uh, you may have felt stuck for years, but now it's time to move into a new direction. Together, we can create the life you've always wanted but didn't know how to make. In our sessions, you'll develop healthy coping skills and self-acceptance. You'll learn to trust yourself and make decisions that empower your life. As a therapist, I've helped counseling, counsel, countless clients. The, the chat is going wild. I've had, <laughs> but the, the, I've helped countless clients overcome depression, anxiety, trauma, and grief. My extensive experience with yoga, meditation, and travel. That's the red flag right there. Travel. Lends to my mindful, holistic, and culturally competent therapeutic approach. Okay, guys, it's not against the law to say that travel is something that helps you counsel people, but it is a little strange. That's fine. We're not, we're not here to, we're not here to mock anybody. We're just, we're here to look at copy. Um, all right, here's what I see as the issue. Anyone else find anything additional? I am the best connotation. Yeah, I mean, you can make a claim that you're the best. I mean, you just have to be able to substantiate it, right? Because that's in the law. You have to be able to substantiate claims. Now, that's more of a subjective claim. I don't think you're going to get a report for that. If you said my technique is has been proven to work, then you got to say, okay, well, what do you mean proven? Like, for example, uh, uh, Tony Robbins has on his site that his his events have a 90%. I, I don't want to exaggerate it. Um, don't quote me. Just look at the website. It's right there. Like a 90% uh, like positive, I don't know why I'm blanking on the word, um, success, success rate. Yeah. Nice success rate at curing depression. Pretty wild claim. But then he goes on the page and Harvard did a study on it. Harvard did a study with like tens of thousands of people who have been to his events. And that's what they found. It's pretty weird, right? Tony Robbins, how about it? Hey, so if you're going to make a claim, you got to substantiate it. Now that substantiation can come into question. We could go look at the methodology. We could go look and see I don't know if, if there was any errors in how the study was conducted, but I don't know. That's not my job. That's the FTC's job. Um, all right, so how do we fix this? Here's what I do. Together, we will journey towards instead of you can't, we can create. Can create feels like a promise, right? Journey towards. And then instead of in our sessions, you will develop, I'll put our sessions will be centered around developing healthy coping skills. Instead of you will learn to, the core of my practice is learning to. All right. I might take out the word overcome and say I've helped countless clients in their journey of overcoming depression. Keep the travel in. That's fine. How's that feel? Awesome change up. Okay. We got some positive thumbs up. Anybody? Anything else that you would change? Anything uh, that I missed? All right, come. Got some good thumbs up. Are we having fun in an ethics course? Anyone? Anyone having a good time? I'm having fun. Yeah, everyone's uh, everyone's nervous about their Psychology Today pages now, huh? If you're a, a group practice, got to look. Go over the content. Aren't you happy you came? Aren't you happy you're here? Are you getting your CT credits? CT. Are you getting your CE credits for this? I've harvested many 
therapeutic modalities, skills, and proficiencies to distill in a program. Oh, everyone's in, everyone in the chat's being really kind and encouraging. Thanks for saying that. Good. All right, so I've harvested many uh, therapeutic modalities, skills, proficiencies to distill into a program that is tuned directly to your unique talents and challenges. I've already done the heavy lifting and learning oodles of strategies and techniques. We just need to see what's right for you. Again, we don't, it's not against the law to use the word oodles. That's fine. That's fine. You can even harvest things. That's fine. And I'm not here to make fun of anybody. This is her personality. That's great. She, she's spunky. She's fun. People are going to love it. Um, any, any ethical issues though? Okay. Someone says nothing wrong. It's too focused on the therapist. I mean, that's an opinion on her copy, but that's not against the law. It can be focused on the therapist. Is she being flirty? Someone says. Wow. That wink face. Pretty, uh, I'm feeling a pretty heavy amount of raw emotion. Are you? Yeah, it could be written better, but not wrong. Okay, well, here's here's what I see as a yellow light. It's just a yellow light. Um, that is tuned directly to your unique talents and challenges. Okay, well, maybe. Um, I've harvested the skills um, to distill into a program that is tuned directly. Like, we don't know. I mean, maybe it is, maybe it's not. You'd have to substantiate that. So what I would say, just to kind of avoid that, would be something like, I am committed to building. And that isn't even, that's not even a guarantee I will. It's not saying I will build a program because we don't know if you will or want, but maybe you're committed to it. Does that, does that make sense what we're doing here? Does this feel better? Yeah. Okay. You, you catching on? We're looking for guarantees. We're looking for promises. We're looking for unstantiated claims. This is your psychology today page is sales copy and it can be in violation of FTC. I'm glad you're here. Let's look at another one. Feel deeply calm and see clearly within to feel healing. Clients often see into their own real-time observation of their life from deep inside. She guides, who's she? I don't know. She guides individuals. I think that means the therapist. She guides individuals ready to change through the process of changing, helping them land in their new lifestyle of a healed outlook and feeling much better. This typically feels good. Gaining new confidence, freedom from pain, physical or emotional, and quitting bad habits such as smoking, binge eating, and other compulsions, such as hand washing or codependency. Um, I don't know. I, I mean, here's the thing. It's not against the law to write a confusing uh, piece of sales copy. That's not, that's not why we're here. We're not here to say that we don't know what in the world you're talking about. But, hey, to each their own. I think this is going to be controversial. I actually think it's fine. Here's why. Here's why. No, no. Hold on. Maybe there's things I'm not seeing, but clients often, she qualifies it. Feel, deep, feel deeply held and see clearly within to feel healing. That's not a statement about the client. That's a statement about what, like, her philosophy of what it means to be healed. Clients often see into their da 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 da, right? And then she says through the process changing, helping them land. She doesn't promise. This typically feels good, guys. I think I think she did fine. Is, is there anything here that I'm not seeing? I mean, tell me in the chat. On, on a, okay, I don't like feel deeply calm. Yeah, again, but that first sentence isn't saying you will feel deeply calm in my practice. That's just, um, I, I, I don't know what that is. I, I don't even know if that's a complete sentence. Um, feel deeply calm and see clearly within to, fe to feel healing. That's like almost like an instruction. It's like, hey, everyone, look clearly within. It's actually an imperative. She says, feel deeply calm, <laughs> right? Like, feel calm, see clearly within. Like, I don't know. I think it's not illegal to tell people to feel deeply calm. You're allowed to instruct people to do that. Um, again, yeah, it's a lot of people are really centered in on this first sentence. It says you can, but I don't think technically grammatically 
she's not making a claim she's giving an instruction you're allowed to tell people to do things that's not against the law at least that's my conviction um and someone's saying i don't think codependency is a compulsion yeah well i mean it's not against a lot of to to be theoretically unsound unfortunately um i don't know maybe maybe okay well we'll move on i think we get it all right so rule number two disclose when you have financial employment personal or familial relationship with a brand so this is actually an ftc2 when we were talking about laws financial relationships aren't limited money disclose the relationship if there's anything right if you've got anything of value to mention a product if a brand gives you a free or discounted product or other perks and then you mention one of its products make sure to disclose even if you weren't asked to mention that product don't assume your followers already know about your brand relationships make disclosures even if you don't think your evaluations are unbiased someone's at amazon reviews yeah certainly if you're promoting a book if you're um going to speak at a conference you can't you can't um pretend that there's no financial element and now i'm not saying it every time you speak somewhere be like i was paid three thousand dollars like you don't have to do that I just there there's the obscure you know, pretending you're doing something for free when really there's financial incentive is is a no-go so um you can't also you can't post fake endorsements or reviews for yourself um you can't pay people to give you fake endorsements that's against the law okay you can read over that i think that's pretty self um explanatory what will my punishment be that's what we're all wondering, right? Um, it's not so bad. Mandate certain disclosures or require that a marketer engage in corrective um, advertising to cure any lingering deception in the marketplace. Um, if particularly egregious and since the FTC has asked a court to ban a company or individual from engaging in certain marketing activities altogether. The FTC can also seek financial remedies, including in some instances, consumer refunds or civil penalties. So that's not so bad, right? They can just, you know, take your whole business away. I'm being um, facetious. I'm sorry. It's a big deal. So you should you should take this seriously. Um, they do have the authority to shut you down. And they can. They, they In some instances, they should. If, if you're doing something that's willingly deceptive to people. Now, I don't think that the FTC is combing through psychology today um, like we just did and looking for maybes and mays and perhaps and looking for those I, I don't but i think that if um we want to raise the bar as a field to be um ethical values-based let's let's really even comb over our own sales copy i think that's a reasonable thing to do um do not fret a company is not liable for every interpretation or action by a consumer this is important in advertising context this principle has been well stated an advertiser cannot be charged with liability with respect to every conceivable misconception however outlandish to which his representations might be subject among the foolish or feeble-minded that's what it says in the government document some people because of ignorance or incomprehension may be misled by an even scrupulous honest claim perhaps a few misguided souls believe for example that all danish pastry is made in denmark it is therefore an actionable deception to advertise danish pastry when it is made in this country of course not a representation does not become false and deceptive merely because it will be unreasonably misunderstood by an insignificant and unrepresentative segment of the class of persons to whom the representation is addressed does that make sense so you don't need to be worried could someone interpret it the wrong way and then feel compelled to have to change it it's that's okay like I think like uh, this comes up, for example, this is what comes to mind for me when people are like, hey, is it even ethical to create products for people who have been through trauma? You know, like if I created a trauma workshop, am I preying on a vulnerable population selling my $50 trauma workshop to a group of people who um, are vulnerable? And my response to that is one, that's a pretty low view of folks who have been through trauma. I don't know if you've been around folks who've been through trauma they're more alert and suspicious than anybody trying to sell to people who have been through trauma is not like a walk in the park like good grief they um they're they're on alert 
Like, and what are you saying? Like, they, they don't have the basic human capacities to make a judgment. Like, you really think like they need to give over, um, like attorney, like client privilege, or what, what am I trying to say? You get what I'm saying? Do you think, uh, we need to sign over the ability to make choices to one of their siblings because they can't make a choice? Power of attorney. Thank you. Power of attorney to people? No. I think it's kind of disrespectful to, it seems like a compassionate thing to say. I think it's actually a pretty disrespectful thing to say. Um, and two, yeah, if, if there's folks who like Danish pastry thing, if there's folks who like, oh, they, they might be misguided. They might, they might kind of like lead in to a sales copy or read into things, um, because of that. I don't think that that's a liability that is, um, that's going to get you shut down by the government. I, I think that's what this is saying right here. Of course, we're going to build our sales copy to be inclusive and understanding of people who are not just folks who've been through trauma, people on the spectrum, people with um, um, learning disabilities, people with you know a full range of potential vulnerabilities. And we're not going to use sales practices that prey on people, obviously. We're not here to prey on people. We're here to get the word out to, to folks who need it so they can feel healing. So yeah, any questions on that front? I think that, that that'd be an interesting thing. Um, <clears throat> Any questions on that in the chat? Um, I'll look here. I haven't looked at the Q&A section in a minute. Oh, need to head to break. Oh, thank you. Yeah, 1250. All right, everybody. Thank you so much. <laughs> thanks, thanks for the thanks for the um the, the the heads up, Spencer. It is 1250. Well, that was actually that was actually really great because I was just gonna give you an assignment um to look through some sales copies. So we'll do that when we get back. So when we get back, we're gonna um evaluate sales copy on your own and you're going to have to go through and see if you can find it and then we'll be good to go we'll do some q a upon return as well thank you everyone thank you so much uh enjoy your lunch we'll be back at two o'clock and i will see you then sorry for keeping you in for four minutes we'll make up for it thanks everyone